convene now for our special meeting, not a study session, special meeting. Uh, and thank you um, to everyone for your hard work in getting prepared for this effort. Uh, Kip, Lori, and the entire team. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to take it away? I, or should we go straight I, to? Is, are, you, are we ready? Oh, let's, let's have a roll call. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's a crazy idea. Yeah, let's do that. Let's see who's here. I can do the roll call. Um, Jimenez? Perales? Cohen? Here. Carrasco? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Arenas? Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Here. Licardo? We're here. We have quorum. Thank okay, you. good. We have a quorum. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Mayor and City Council, for indulging us on this very important topic today on a Friday afternoon. I might turn it over to you, Lori, or to Kip. Okay, Kip, take it away. Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. Thank you, Jennifer. Happy Friday afternoon, Mayor Licardo, City Council staff, consultants, and members of the public. I'm Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager with the responsibility for sustainable and resilient city infrastructure and emergency preparedness which includes the potential of San Jose providing electrical distribution service, which we will discuss presently during this special meeting of City Council. You'll hear in depth from our small but mighty community energy team, led by Lori Mitchell, along with the deep expertise of Jim Caldwell, Deputy Director, and Marco Santiago, Power Resources Specialist. You will also hear the independent analysis and findings developed by Flynn RCI, our consultant on this case study, represented today by Doug Butch, Bocchione, principal at Flynn RCI. And I practice that even. Um, but before I get into the details, I want to take a moment to frame the discussion and present our bottom line conclusion. Framing, the provision of reliable, resilient, carbon-free and affordable electrical power to the businesses and residents of San Jose is critical to day-to-day -day life and our collective economic and environmental future. With the council directed creation of the community energy department and their successful launch and scaling of wholesale energy provision across the entire city, we have made tremendous strides in developing green, reliable, and affordable sources of electricity. But we control neither the long distance high voltage transmission lines managed by Kaizo, nor the local distribution systems that pow deliver power to houses and businesses managed by PG&E. As our always variable California climate changes even more and becomes warmer and drier, the threats to the reliability of the aging grid become more and more apparent, from increased threats of wildfires to our recent experiences of power outages. You have consistently asked us to look at ways to make the grid more resilient and reliable, and as part of this, we have, you have asked that we explore the option to provide city electrical service to the Downtown West project. The Downtown West project is the approximately 80 plus acres of downtown land that will dramatically expand our urban core with Google, homes, businesses, and vibrant public spaces. Bottom line, the case study for the Downtown West project that you will review here today demonstrates the opportunity for the city to partner with developers to achieve the shared objectives of providing reliable, resilient, carbon-free power to customers within a new development at a competitive cost compared to traditional investor-owned utility services. The base case estimates rate savings for the city's utility services in the range of 15 to 25% and is in line with the demonstrated experience from small and large public utilities throughout California. While there are scenarios resulting in costs that could exceed the benchmark service cost, these scenarios can largely be foreseen and mitigated. The city and the developer can address the potential negative outcomes together. There are also scenarios that would provide significantly higher savings than the base case, which would translate to lower rates for occupants of downtown West development. In addition to the potential cost savings, the city would have the ability to adopt applicable design standards and rules and regulations that could allow for a more advanced microgrid and accommodates more on-site distributed energy resources and improves electrical reliability and resiliency. This would significantly contribute to improved resiliency within the new developments, increased on-site distribution energy resources, and facilitate the achievement of Climate Smart San Jose goals. So with that, I'll hand it over to the team of experts and go into the details and see what this means in practice. Lori? Thank you, Kip. So 
So I'm Lori Mitchell, I'm the Director of Community Energy and very pleased to be joined today, as Kip uh, mentioned, by Jim Caldwell, our Deputy Director of Energy Resiliency, Marco Santiago, he's our Power Resource Specialist, and Doug Boncioni, who is the consultant on this project. So first I thought uh, we would go through a little bit of background. Oops. So as you know, we have had uh, several directions from the mayor and council on this topic. So this started back in 2019 in June um, at the Rules Committee where we were directed to hold a study session to inform the council and to educate the public about the challenges that San Jose and other cities face regarding maintaining electric reliability and resilience. And this was really in, in response to PG&E's wildfire mitigation plan where they introduced the concept of public safety power shutoffs. And we were informed in that plan of the potential for San Jose and other cities of being completely dark during one of these public safety power shutoffs. So in response to that, uh, this memo was directed. And then in August of 2019, we did hold a study session so we discussed options to improve resilience, reliability, and the efficiency of electric service. And we also included the possibility of forming a city-owned microgrid to serve downtown west as one of the options. Then in October, the Rules Committee approved a memo from the mayor titled Public Safety Power Shutoffs, Making San Jose Grid Resilient. This included many recommendations and directions to staff to explore various methods to improve grid resiliency, and this was in response to several public safety power shutoffs that San Jose experienced in August and September of 2019. So in terms of previous public meetings, um, you may recall back on February 10th, 2020, Council authorized us to file a wholesale transmission service interconnection application. And this allowed us to begin exploring the option to provide city electrical service to downtown West. And then on March 25th, more recently of 2021, Council held a study session discussing three options for providing a district system approach to downtown West. So the first one included PG&E retail service, which is the status quo today. The second one was city provided service, and then the third was Google or developer provided service. And then on May 25th of that year, as part of a supplemental memorandum to the development agreement, we provided information on the initial legal, regulatory, and economic feasibility, as well as the potential benefits and risks of city provided electric service. So today we're gonna to expand on that work. As you can see, we've been at this for a couple of years and very excited today to present a case study for providing the service to Downtown West. But before that, we'll talk a little bit about the grid resiliency issues in San Jose, give some background on publicly owned utilities, and then get into the results of the case study. And finally, we'll conclude with our conclusions and then next steps. So in terms of grid resiliency, we have had several reliability concerns in San Jose. Um, one of the types of outages that San Jose has experienced is distribution level outages. These are equipment outages that have happened here. This first started most recently um, back in August of 2020. We had a large heat wave in San Jose and throughout the state in the western US. And during that time, we had 573 separate distribution outages that impacted about 250,000 residents across San Jose. Many of these outages lasted 24 to 72 hours, so they were very long in duration. And to put that in perspective, that's about a quarter of the city that was impacted in that event. And then on August 18th, we had a substation outage near downtown that impacted about 10,000 customers. And then most recently last week with the heat wave that was experienced throughout uh, California and the West, we had several distribution outages. You can see the map here on the right is a quick snapshot of some of those outages that occurred. That was on September 6, where nearly 100,000 residents were impacted, including three of our hospitals. And then the following day, another 22,000 residents were impacted by these outages. 
We've also been impacted by other types of outages. So the other main type that has impacted San Jose are public safety power shutoffs. These are planned outages where PG&E proactively turns off the power in order to not start a wildfire. Um, so as I mentioned before, these first started back in 2019, and now they have been expanded to also include their enhanced power line safety settings, which is a new program where their power lines will trip offline if they are, um, if there's a, a weather event or something that hits them in order to prevent a wildfire. We have also been under the threat of rolling blackouts from generation shortages. These are very rare, both in California and in the US, but they occur when there's not enough generation on the grid to support the load. So California has only had these, two, these types of outages twice in recent history. Once was in the early 2000s, and then more recently in August of 2020. California experienced rolling blackouts, but San Jose did not. What we experienced during that time frame was distribution outages. And then most recently, we were under threat of them last week <laughs> due to the heat wave that it impacted California and the entire US grid. Um, they were ultimately prevented through conservation and turning on a, additional generation. But we know that both of these types of outages are an increasing concern as electrical loads rise, you know, really related to these heat storms that are becoming both more frequent and more severe. So in terms of impacts from these power outages, there's life and safety issues. Um, most importantly, our residents are often exposed to severe weather, mostly that's heat here in California. It also strains our critical facilities that rely on backup power. Um, they can also have an inability to support power, um, power devices that uh, support medical equipment. It leads to a lack of refrigeration, so medicine and food spoilage. It can lead to a number of traffic safety issues. And it can also lead to just lost productivity and high greenhouse gases as many backup generators are turned on uh, to support critical facilities. So what can we do about this? Well, uh, improve the grid. So first we thought we would start with a definition. So grid resiliency. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission defines this as the ability to withstand and reduce the magnitude and or the duration of disruptive events, which includes the capability to anticipate, absorb, adapt to, and rapidly recover from such an event. So although the focus today is on providing electric service to new developments, we know that this is not the solution to the entire city, and there's other things we also need to work on. So for us, that means having a more robust uh, distribution grid and better access to customers for their own generation, which often means solar and storage. It also means having sufficient transmission capacity so that will allow for growth and resources to come into San Jose when we have extreme weather. It also means protecting our critical loads with local clean generation and storage, as well as microgrids. And then finally, what we'll focus on today is more local control of the electric service focused on new developments. So before we get into the case study, we thought we would provide a little bit of background about public utilities, um, where they exist in the United States and California. You can see the map here. They're very common throughout the United States. There's over 2,000 US publicly owned utilities. They're in almost every state, and one in seven Americans is served by a publicly owned utility. They often provide higher reliability, and then they reinvest their revenues back into communities by and large offering lower rates. They also offer payment in lieu of taxes to the local government, so this replaces franchise fees and the utility user tax that they would otherwise receive from the investor-owned utility. They also provide local jobs, they support local programs. So as you can see on this map, some of the largest publicly owned utilities in the United States, um, two of them are actually here in California, Los Angeles Water and Power and SMUD, which serves Sacramento, but other common um, large utilities in Seattle, Seattle City Light, Austin Energy, uh, Nashville is served by a publicly owned utility, Orlando, Long Island, and then many other small cities as you can see on this map. 
So here in California, we have 46 publicly owned utilities, which you can see on the map here. They serve about 25% of Californians. And as I mentioned, the two largest are Los Angeles Water and Power. That's actually the largest publicly owned utility in the US. And then SMUD, which is the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, which serves the Sacramento region. But there's also many small publicly owned utilities. The city of Healdsburg operates a public utility, Shasta Lake, the city of Lompoc near Santa Barbara. And then there's many, many medium-sized public utilities. Um, we have great examples of that in our backyard here with Santa Clara and Palo Alto. San Francisco is also considered a medium-sized public utility because they don't serve the entire city with their public utility. They serve part of it and then the rest of it with their CCA. But then down south, many public utilities um, in Southern California as well, some notable ones, Pasadena and Anaheim. If you go to Disneyland, that's powered by Anaheim Public Utilities. Um, they're also common in uh, the Central Valley, so Roseville operates a publicly owned utility right near SMUD. So as you can see, they're, they're common and, and throughout the entire state of California. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Marcos Santiago, and he's going to talk a little bit more about these publicly owned utilities. Thank you, Lori. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Council members, uh, and members of the public. My name um, is Marco Santiago. I am the Power Resources Specialist uh, with the Community Energy Department. Um, and you've heard us mention that public power uh, is more reliable. One way we can measure that is by looking at the typical duration of an outage for customers every year. Um, the national uh, average for customers, um, they typically experience about two and a half hours without power every year. When we focus in on publicly owned utilities customers, um, that comes down to less than half of the national average, so less than one hour without power per year for these customers. Um, this is uh, a significant reduction, um, and here at San Jose, we've seen that usually uh, these hours occur when energy is needed the most um, and when lives uh, are at stake. We've also said that public power um, or publicly owned utilities can have lower cost. Um, the tables here show uh, how, how significant those savings can be. Um, our neighbor, the city of Santa Clara, operates a utility called Silicon Valley Power. They're able to offer uh, rates for their residential customers that are 48% lower um, than PG&E, and for their commercial customers, um, they're up to 38% lower than PG&E. Sacramento Municipal Utility District um, achieves similar savings to Silicon Valley Power for both their residential and commercial customers. Um, and Alameda Municipal Power um, is slightly, or is, is smaller than the other two, but is still able to achieve savings for the residential customers um, of 31.5% uh, uh, compared to PG&E for, for residential, um, and 18, up to 18.9% lower for commercial customers. Finally, uh, the Los, Ange Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, uh, which was mentioned on the uh, previous slide, um, has rates that are 31% lower for their residential customers than the competing investor-owned utility, um, and up to 27% lower for their commercial customers. So these are four great examples um, of you know, how significant these savings can be, but we mentioned uh, that we have 46 publicly owned utilities throughout the state, um, and here the story is no different. So on average, uh, in California, Publicly owned utilities have rates uh, that are 17.4% lower for residential customers than the competing investor owned utilities and 14.7% lower for commercial uh, customers. Um, what, sorry, can we go back to that slide real quick, Larry? Um, one way that these savings um, are achieved, or, or a couple of ways, is that uh, revenues for publicly owned utilities do not need to be um, invested into share, increased shareholder returns and can instead be reinvested back into the local community in the form of lower rates or other um, community benefits. Um, they're also not subject to uh, federal taxes and they're able to leverage their government status to secure a lower cost of capital. 
Um, now what, what uh, we thought we'd do is uh, dive a little bit deeper into some of these examples to really get an idea of uh, not just the savings and reliability, um, but also a little bit more on how these utilities operate. Um, so as we mentioned, Silicon Valley Power serves uh, the city of Santa Clara. Um, they provide cleaner energy to the residents and businesses than um, the competing investor-owned utility, and they've actually opted to provide 100% carbon-free energy uh, for all of their residents. And keep in mind, this is at rates that are 26 to 48 percent lower uh, than their competitors. They're governed by the Santa Clara City Council, which uh, sets rates and determines the general direction uh, for the utility. Um, and they also own several distribution assets uh, for the entire city. So um, just want to quickly point out that San Jose has experience in the um, you know, electric industry through San Jose Clean Energy. San Jose Clean Energy is the electric service provider for all of San Jose. Um, but while we provide generation service, publicly owned utilities go a step above that and also provide um, distribution service. So amongst other things, this means um, owning and maintaining uh, distribution assets. Um, and in the case of Silicon Valley Power, uh, they own and maintain 374 miles of underground lines and 186 miles uh, of overhead lines. Alameda Municipal Power is another example just up the road. They're governed by the Alameda Public Utilities Board, um, which is again the, the local government entity there. Um, and their rates are 31 to 49 percent lower uh, than the competing investor-owned utility. Similar to Santa Clara, um, they own distribution assets for the entire city of Alameda, um, and they maintain these distribution assets. Um, and we also have the city of Hillsburg, which is um, an example of a uh, much smaller uh, utility. They serve um, just under 5,800 meters in the city of Hillsburg. They're governed by the Hillsburg City Council, which again sets rates and determines the general direction for the utility. Um, and their rates are approximately 33% lower than the investor-owned utility there. Um, I mentioned earlier that service um, for publicly owned utilities goes a bit beyond what community choice aggregators usually do. And so here we see some examples of that on the right with workers performing repairs and preventative maintenance, maintenance on electric infrastructure, and then also testing the meters um, that are used by the residents and businesses there. Um, this municipal utility owns and maintains 28 miles of underground lines and 28 miles of overhead lines. Um, and then, uh, you know, service goes beyond just the, the power lines. There's also a substation that they maintain, Badger substation. Uh, they maintain 800 transformers um, and 1,300 streetlights. Um, so we've covered three examples here of uh, utilities that have successfully brought greater value uh, and reliability to their community. Now I'm going to hand it off to Jim Caldwell to go through examples uh, that de really demonstrate the wide range of possibilities and added flexibility that publicly owned utilities can provide. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, Council members, and the public. Uh, my name is Jim Caldwell, and I'm the Deputy Director in the Community Energy Department, and it just so happens that today is my first year anniversary with the city, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. This is my first time before Council, but I, I really appreciate it and uh, came here to do this work. Um, before we get into Downtown West, uh, I thought it would be useful to talk about a couple of other examples from around the world uh, where public utilities make a difference uh, and demonstrate some of the flexibility that it maintains. And the first uh, example is in, is in Hawaii, where historically the Hawaiian Islands uh, generated almost all of their electricity from imported oil. And as a result, their rates have been high, their greenhouse gas emissions have been high. And as uh, renewables became more of a viable uh, uh, way to generate electricity, Hawaii was among the first uh, places in the country or in the world where this actually became part of the, the routine way to generate electricity. Uh, at the beginning, that's relatively easy. You just go out there and you do it. But as you begin to make 
all of these investments in, in different ways of generating the electricity, then the grid itself has to adapt to these new, new resources. And in Hawaii, uh, there were two governance structures. One was the investor-owned utilities uh, covering the Big Island and, and uh, Oahu, and then uh, rural electric co-op in Kauai. And the rural electric co-op in Kauai achieved better results than the other, other islands. Uh, they got to uh, essentially 90% carbon-free faster. Uh, they got there cheaper, they were more reliable, and a big part of that was because they were partners with their customers and that the partnership between the utility and the customers allowed them to just do it, to get out there and to make, to make the changes that were required and, to, and to, to make it happen as opposed to arguing about it before a commission uh, and coming down with rulings and so forth. So, uh, uh, the other example that, that I'd like to talk about a little bit is, is talking about uh, providing electric service to a specific piece of the city, and that uh, the example there we have is the city of Gonzales uh, down near uh, uh, Salinas, if you, if you don't know where that is. Uh, Gonzales had a, or has a, a development, economic development zone geared towards uh, agricultural, and uh, that development zone was, was having difficulties with both the cost and the reliability of electric service, and so the city of Gonzales formed a municipal utility, uh, is building a parallel distribution system and under contract is acquiring generation resources, natural gas, and, uh, and a lot of solar uh, to serve that, uh, that development zone. Uh, it's under construction at the moment, and the startup is planned for 2024. Uh, so, again, the, the thing that really distinguishes uh, the publicly owned uh, city electric service from the investor owned utility is the flexibility and the ability to adapt uh, the to adapt to the local conditions to uh, deal with the local uh, issues to ensure equity amongst all of the all of the participants uh, and uh, what that does is, is it enables again more clean energy it help, would help us achieve our climate smart uh, San Jose goals, the design flexibility, the operating flexibility that we have means that uh, uh, grid modernization and integration of smart grid technologies, uh, we enable more customer participation in demand response and load shaping, we're more nimble uh, and more, more resilient. Uh, and, and as I say, very important about the equity uh, and, and the fact that uh, it is the city council uh, that, that governs the uh, uh, rate setting process and so forth as opposed to a commission in San Francisco. And it potentially reduces cost. Now the pathway for city electric service is that the city has the statutory authority under state law and the city charter to provide power uh, to two developments in San Jose. Uh, we worked with Flynn uh, to study this potential and we're using the Downtown West project as a case study. Uh, and the case study, as, as we'll go into, did conclude that uh, uh, San Jose can own and operate the distribution system infrastructure and as Marcos pointed out, uh, that, that now through the CCA we supply the energy, but the distribution, the billing, the customer service and all of that comes out through PG&E. And so uh, uh, th this, this additional service through the city-owned electric utility uh, is, is what we're talking about today. So let's move on to, uh, to the case study itself. Uh, and I'll just introduce it a little bit before I turn it over to Doug. Uh, but the Downtown West development um, is an 80-acre development that was 
that was introduced by Google in 2019. Uh, it basically follows along the rail corridor to the, to the west of us. About halfway up the development is the Diridon station. And right opposite the Diridon station and the thing is the central utilities building where the uh, campus, if you will, the whole development, uh, the, uh, the utilities for, for the whole development uh, are, are housed and, the, and the, the system is designed to be operated or, or is, is designed to be operated as a campus. Um, what that looks like is on the next slide. Uh, this is the energy demands and the load forecast for the, for the development. Uh, those are years on the bottom of the slide, so that uh, the load is, is currently projected to start up. The first building is, is to be occupied in late 2027. And then the load grows as the buildings are commissioned at roughly 10% per year. Uh, and in, by the early 30s, it tends to level off and then pulls out to, to full load uh, in the early 2040s. That is the current uh, commissioning schedule for, for Google. Uh, along with that 40 megawatts or so of load for the thing on site, uh, currently there's estimated to be uh, 7.8 megawatts of solar. Uh, and two hours of battery storage per hour of, uh, of uh, per, per megawatt of, uh, of, of solar. Uh, and then there is also significant uh, uh, thermal storage available through the uh, central utilities plant. Uh, under city utility service, uh, all of those resources would be shared uh, between the buildings, uh, and the distribution of that of those energy sources. Some of the buildings have more load, some of the buildings have more generation, and by by sharing that, uh, you achieve some significant advantages in terms of the demand for for the buildings and the ability to to install more cost-effective uh, on-site generation and to operate that uh, in a manner that, that results in lower greenhouse gas emissions and lower cost. That type of service of sharing across the public rights-of-way is not available under uh, uh, IOU service. Uh, there will be a microgrid uh, that, that we will uh, construct uh, on that site. Uh, that microgrid is not yet designed. Uh, it will only, there, there is only enough energy in the uh, solar on the site uh, to support a, a, a relatively small fraction of the load, uh, but uh, the, the platform that we create for the microgrid uh, will will ser serve that part of the of the downtown uh, very well in the event of an outage. To illustrate some of the advantages of uh, this uh, district system or um, uh, campus type service, we look at here, and this is what happens on a hot summer day. Uh, the Blue uh, represents the loads, and as the, uh, as the sun comes up and the air conditioning loads begin to take over, the loads go up. Uh, and that, that solar fraction, though, uh, it tends to come on at noon. Uh, and then some of that energy is uh, used to serve load. The rest of it is used to charge the batteries, and then those batteries are discharged uh, after the sun goes down. And what happens? then is that that load levels off, uh, puts less demand on the grid, puts less demand on the, uh, on the distribution system, and results in lower cost of operation by, by using, again, these resources across the buildings uh, in, a, in a campus mode. Uh, to, to get into the economics of all of that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, our consultant, uh, uh, Flynn Resources, Inc., and uh, Doug Boxigone. Thank you, Jim. 
uh, mayor, council members, city staff, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Doug Bochin Yone. I'm president of Flynn Resource Consultants. The city hired our firm to do a case study to look at service to the Downtown West project by city-owned utility and compare that to the alternative investor-owned utility service. And our, our economic analysis made several assumptions. One of the key assumptions was that the developer would construct the infrastructure and turn it over to the utility for the city to own and operate. That's consistent with the standard practice. Uh, we also assumed that the developer would fund the startup cost for the initial years of the utility's operations. Uh, this is really necessary because the, the loads are relatively low early on and the, there are some fixed costs that need to be recovered and the uh, revenues in the early years aren't sufficient to support that. So it's essentially uh, necessitates a loan that would be repaid if and when the revenues were sufficient to cover the going forward costs and also cover the costs of the, the startup funding. The model that we developed compared the cost to serve the downtown west load from the status quo service, so we call that the benchmark, um, to city service. The, the key issue is to compare the the cost to provide distribution service. Uh, the energy costs will be the same, whether it's uh, city utility or the investor-owned utility. And a key driver of the benchmark distribution costs are expected to be some significant system hardening costs to address the wildfire risks that the IOU faces, and also to modernize their distribution system, which is quite old and in many parts of the state uh, requires significant investment. Because of that, the expectation is, based on the IOU's filings, that there, there are going to be some significant cost increases for distribution rates in the coming years. Um, and then we assume that after, around 2030, those rates would level off and, and escalate just at inflation. As I mentioned, the energy supply will be the same, whether it's provided by the CCA or provided by the city utility. So the, there's really not a significant difference in cost related to the uh, providing the, the power uh, to the city utility. There are some small differences, uh, but the most of the differences are related to the distribution uh, system. And of course, a key difference in cost is that the city service is, is cost of service based. As Marcos mentioned, there's, there's uh, some significant savings because there aren't shareholder returns, the cost of capital is lower, uh, and uh, the city are able to provide service at a lower cost than investor-owned utilities across the country. So when we did our analysis, we found that there were several key cost drivers. Uh, I've mentioned the benchmark delivery rates as being particularly important. Uh, those, in addition to that, the actual load levels are, are a significant uh, cost driver. Um, as the load level increases, uh, the cost per kilowatt hour to serve the loads de declines uh, pretty rapidly. And, and um, that startup period, I think Jim mentioned, it's about 10% per year as the buildings come on. That makes a big difference. And if there are, were to be delays or if the old total load would be less than what was assumed, then the cost would have to be higher. Um, another important cost driver are the, the staffing costs. Um, we looked at the, the the staffing levels that were are required to serve other similarly sized utilities to estimate what staff would be required here. Um, th this development would enjoy some cost savings because it will be brand new equipment installed and it will all be underground. Um, so that will help to uh, allow for lower uh, staffing costs. Um, but we did look at what would happen if the staffing costs were significantly higher and still found that it was competitive. 
Um, and then I, I've included in this chart the departing load charges, uh, otherwise known as the PCIA. I'm, you're all familiar with that, with the CCA. This actually does not turn out to be a, a significant cost for the, the city utility. Um, and in fact, our belief is that it should not even apply uh, given the existing rules and the precedent at the CPUC. However, just to be conservative in our base case assumption, we assume those costs would apply. Um, so let's talk about our analysis findings. I mean, the bottom line is the, the rates are competitive. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we over the life of the project, they, our expectation is they would be 15% to 25% lower than the benchmark. Um, the, the graph, it, what it's showing is the dark red line is the benchmark cost per kilowatt hour to provide service to the project overall. Um, the dark blue line is the baseline cost for the city utility service. Uh, the, the red hash lines around the, the red line are the range of costs uh, for some of the more severe scenar sensitivity scenarios that we ran. Um, and then the light gray or light blue uh, shading around the, the dark blue line is the range of costs for the city provided service. So you can see that under most conditions, the city service is expected to be lower than the benchmark service and even under very extreme uh, sort of uh, worst case scenarios. Uh, in some scenarios, it could be higher than the benchmark service, but our expectation is that it would be lower under most scenarios. Uh, we assume that the rates would be comparable to the, the benchmark rates in the early years and again, this is based on some of the startup funding. Um, and once that funding is paid off, then there's a lot of headroom for, uh, for cost savings. Uh, under a combination of un unfavorable sensitivities that res result in unfavorable scenarios, we, we did see cases where costs could be five to 10% above the benchmark rates. Uh, but there were also uh, many uh, favorable scenarios where the savings would be 30 to 50 percent below uh, the benchmark. So it, it was really important based on some of the experience with the CCA uh, that we spent a lot of time looking at, you know, we made some very conservative assumptions to start with, but then we said, what happens if things go against us? What if we get scenarios where the outcome is less favorable? And what can we do to mitigate those risks? And what we found was there were three main risks, the, the level of the load, so the accuracy of the load forecast, the level of the benchmark rates is obviously a, a critical factor if we're comparing ourselves to the benchmark. Um, and then the staffing levels were also important. And for each of these risks, we looked at what potential mitigation measures might be. So for the first one, the load forecast risk, as I mentioned, the, the load is expected to grow um, over time in, in about 10% increments, but if it grows uh, more slowly than that, or if there are delays in the development and the staffing uh, doesn't align with the, the, uh, that slower load growth, then that can result in uh, higher cost per kilowatt hour. Um, so we looked at, you know, how can we mitigate this? And it, the, the best mitigation measure is that the developer would be providing the startup cost funding and that funding would only be reimbursed when the revenues were sufficient to support the going forward operation and to pay back the, the, the fund, the startup funds. Um, another important mitigation is that if, if, um, I guess I already mentioned this, the, the, linking it to the low growth, but in terms of the potential impact on uh, the other city customers who aren't taking service from Downtown West, 
they really wouldn't see that because they continue to be served by the CCA um, and the general fund would not need to, to support this uh, effort because it would be funded from the startup funding provided by the developer. Um, and then just a point that, you know, the, the first development is in some ways the riskiest because you have to staff up just to provide service to that development. But if you were to provide s similar service to other developments in the future, the risk, the, the incremental risk to serve those, those developments will be significantly less than for this first development. So the benchmark rate, you know, we looked at a 50 year time horizon. It's very difficult to predict what the cost to, of the IOU service is gonna be over the next 50 years. But we have a pretty good idea in the early years just based on some of the recent rate filings that go out for the next three years. And there are some significant rate increases coming uh, for the IOU service. Um, primarily driven by wildfire mitigation costs and, and this modernization costs. Um, you know, we based our analysis of those costs based on the actual rate filings that have been made that that's go span through the next three years, and then some uh, uh, rate forecast made by the CPUC. Uh, but, you know, there could be changes in how some of those costs are recovered, uh, particularly the wildfire related costs. And it's possible that those might not be included in electric rates, in the, or at least some portion might not be included and potentially could be shifted to other parts of the, the state general fund or you know, via taxes. And if, if that were to happen, then that benchmark cost will, could be lower. So th there, there is some risk there. An important way to mitigate that risk is to uh, wait until after the cost of service study has been performed closer to the time when utility service will be provided in, in the 25, 26 timeframe, when more information will be known about the benchmark and also the city cost, and use that information to inform the decision to actually make the commitment to provide the city utility service. And then the, the other issue is thinking about the CCA experience. You know, the CCA customers came on very, very rapidly once you made the decision. I think it was over the course of about a, a little over the, a year that you went from no customers to essentially almost all the load in the city. And in this case, it's, it's gonna be spread over a longer period of time. So it's gonna be really important to align the decisions on staffing levels with the, the best information you have at the time as about when the, the buildings will be built and the loads will be come online. So let's talk about staffing levels. Um, you know, if staffing levels are significantly higher, I think we assumed in a scenario, one scenario that they could be 100%, you know, double the, the cost of our baseline assumptions. Um, the, the way to mitigate the risk associated with higher staffing costs, it, a key issue is to uh, perform an operation and maintenance study as the system is designed and uh, prior to it being constructed so that you can align the staffing levels with the actual uh, distribution system that is built. And as I mentioned, it's gonna be a completely underground distribution system, which tends to have a lower cost to serve than an above ground system. Um, and then the other is to do a, develop the staffing plan closer to providing the actual service. Um, coordinating very, very closely with the developer about their plans for completing the project will be really critical here uh, to make sure you get that alignment. Um, and I mentioned the, the difference in the startup period versus the CCA. And then the last risk, I've included it here, not because it's a significant risk, because we found that the departing load charges weren't particularly uh, uh, critical for this project. Um, but given the experience with the CCA and your familiarity with it, I wanted to mention it. Um, you know, th these are charges that are assessed to the customers, not to the utility. But you know, you're trying to provide a competitive service overall to the customers. Our view is that the PCIA charges should not apply. Uh, these were not meant to apply in, in this type of circumstance uh, 
PG&E was never going to serve these customers when they made the procurement that the above market procurement that they're trying to recover in the PCIA. And in fact, the, the plain language of the rules about the applicability of these charges makes it pretty obvious they shouldn't apply. Nevertheless, in our base case, we assume that they did apply just to be conservative. Um, the best way to mitigate this is to, you know, monitor the proceedings and, if necessary, actively engage in the proceedings that would take place at the CPUC to challenge the applicability of the PCIA to protect the customers of this project. And that's all I have on the economic analysis, and I think Lori's going to go to the next section. Thank you very much, Doug. So just a few more slides if you bear with us. So in terms of that startup timeline, as Doug mentioned, it is a lot different than what we experienced with the CCA. Um, it's a much longer time horizon, and that's primarily because it follows the construction build out. And so in some ways, that, that is a very positive thing because it allows time to put together a number of agreements that would be needed um, to provide this service. So just as a reminder of where we are today, we're uh, presenting the case study and the action will be to accept it. If we proceed, uh, we plan to bring forward municipal code revisions to form the municipal utility by the end of the year. This is important to the developer. And then there's going to be a number of steps over the next five years that we would have to take. And this isn't unlike what we did for the CCA. Um, as you recall, council approved Title 26. And then I brought forward a number of operating agreements, a staffing plan, um, authority to buy power before we launched that service about a year later. Um, so some of the, the key milestones that we'd have to complete over this timeline, um, number one is this business agreement that defines the funding of the startup costs. We've talked a lot with the developer about this and have agreement and concept, but very important to put pen to paper and get that business agreement um, you know, in writing and then approved by council. Following that, uh, really important to create design standards for the utility. Um, as Jim and Doug mentioned, this is standard for all publicly owned utilities. What PG&E uses right now is something that they call the green book, and that's what developers build to. Um, so we would expect our design standards would be similar, but they would allow for that flexibility to share resources across the building. So that's something that would need to be completed. Um, additionally, utility rules and regulations would need to be completed, so this defines, you know, how the utility operates and what those rules are. Really important to do that. And then finally, we'd have to approve the interconnection agreement to the transmission system, as well as operating agreements with the California ISO. We had to do some similar things uh, like this to form the CCA, if you recall. Um, we brought forward a scheduling agreement where we schedule our power into the CAISO market with them. And then finally, um, you know, as Doug mentioned, we really important to complete an operations and maintenance plan and then a staffing plan. We'll need to work with HR to talk about classifications. Likely there would be new classifications needed. Again, this is not unlike the CCA, where I brought forward a staffing plan. We created some new power resource uh, classifications. So important to do that planning work early, well before we hire those classifications, so that we have a good plan in place. And then finally, you know, you see this yellow highlight, as Doug mentioned, really, really important to start that cost of service study closer to when we would actually begin operations and confirm what the rates are. So at that point, we really want to check what the regulations are, what the rate filings, um, you know, what, what has occurred, where are those benchmark rates, and, and what are our actual costs given our operations and our staffing plan. And that would really inform whether or not to proceed. And really important to note that, that most of the work really up until then really doesn't obligate either the city or the developer, but really lays the groundwork to be able to provide this service. But obviously, uh, once we start hiring staff and once we begin operations, you know, we're fully in that business and we really need to make sure that we're set up to be able to do that. So those are some of the final steps. And then, of course, approving those rates and those tariffs, which would be an ongoing item that the council would approve. 
similar what, to what you do for the CCA where we bring forward rate recommendations annually. Okay, so in terms of some key conclusions, um, you know, number one, we concluded that city electric service to downtown West could provide improved resiliency, clean energy, and lower rates. Um, the financial risks for the startup remain principally with the developer. Um, city electric service to other new developments may present similar benefits and opportunities, but just really important to confirm the technical feasibility for new locations. One of the things that'll be important to confirm is the location to a transmission line. Uh, downtown West is well suited because there is a transmission line near there. There are transmission lines in other parts of the city, but that would be important to confirm. Um, and then some important findings, um, as I said before, proceeding with these investigation and initial startup steps does not commit the city or the developer. You know, I'll remind you in the development agreement, the developer does have three options. You know, right now they are funding this work and, you know, we're proceeding, but really important to continue to check in in that business agreement to make sure we're still aligned. And then finally, the cost of service study should be really a key driver of the decision whether or not to provide the service. And that should be performed very close to the beginning of the operations phase before we hire significant staff. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lori. Thanks to everyone for your great work and presenting all this information to us. Uh, really important. I know we've got a long way to go, but it seems like we're off to a great start. Um, should we go to the public first, Grace? Do you have some? Yes, we have one hand up. Um, great. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. This item, that was good learning processing experience for myself. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put uh, community energy on the spot. Uh, there's been a lot of hopes of, of community energy and what it can accomplish. Uh, Lori Mitchell, who I like very much, has spoken often in the past of how 2023 would kind of be a, a breakthrough year for community energy, make or break. <laughs> Uh, choose your terms. Uh, 2023 has always been considered an important year in community energy in the Bay Area. I'm interested to know why. You know the kind of theories I came up with in the past that I've been worried about, about natural disaster preparedness that I don't think is really going to happen at this point, but I'm not being given much information about programs in 2023 to say otherwise. So I'm not entirely sure what sort of emergency planning needs we need for the next year in comparison to what this kind of uh, uh, project is offering, the study session is offering. Um, but it's good to hear, you know, I, 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 I hope the city of San Jose really considers the future of nuclear and doesn't go all out gung ho on the future of nuclear and really tries to consider options. I've tried to offer the options of, of Northwest uh, water power, hydro, as a, as a way to address issues. I know you guys have a moral stand against that, but uh, I, I think a moral stand against uh, hydro power from say Central America at this time may be even a stronger force and has some of the same reasoning as uh, you know, Northwest Power uh, Hydro from 50, 80 years ago. So good luck in how you talk about this item and, and, and the ways to talk about renewables before nuclear. Thank you. Back to the committee. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Blair. Uh, let's go to the council. Council Member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we're all big fans of Lori and your department. So th thank you for the presentation and the uh, and, and all this information. I have a, a number of questions because it's, it's, it's pretty overwhelming to understand how you get from where we are today to something like this or what it is that we're even talking about for sure. Um, let me just ask more generally, you, you showed all these public utilities around the state, some are in small cities, some are in large places. How, do, how, do, how did one of those jurisdictions start? Were these because they started early on before there was an infrastructure and they built it themselves? Um, my understanding is PG&E isn't necessarily selling their infrastructure. So how did many of these um, public utilities begin? Yeah, it's a really great question. And um, it actually goes back to 100 years ago, if you, if you might imagine. Um, 
So in the early days of electrification, many cities owned street lighting, right? That was some of the first things that were actually electrified, you know, in the early part of the 19th century. And, you know, as things evolved, some cities kept that service over time and then connected residents and, and businesses to their electrical system. And then in other areas, there were private companies that offered that service. And um, as you might imagine along the way, a lot of mergers, acquisitions, and um, you know, that's how PG&E you know, offers that service today. Um, you know, they ended up acquiring a lot of private entities that provided that service in you know, the 1930s and 40s. And along the way, some cities just continue to keep the service. So most of the municipal utilities that are in operation today are, have actually been in it for about 100 years and have been providing that service since the early days of electrification. There are some examples of municipal utilities um, that formed after that. So San Fran or Sacramento or SMUD, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District is an example. They actually started their effort. They were originally served by PG&E. Um, they were not happy with the reliability of their service in the 1930s and 40s, um, mostly because they felt like uh, PG&E prioritized San Francisco <laughs> over them. And so they went through a multi-year effort to municipalize that area and provide that service. Um, so there are examples there, both in California and across the country, of um, some examples where cities have gotten into this business, you know, post early 19th century. But most of them started with street lighting. So there's are there examples much more recent than that um, in the last maybe 20 years, as opposed to the 30s, 40s, 50s time frame? Yeah, so um, those were some of the ones that Jim pointed out. So the city of Gonzalez, um, you know, to do the microgrid. Actually, San Francisco right now is going through a process to municipalize their city. Before that, they started uh, just expanding their municipal utility to serve new development. So Candlestick, you know, down the waterfront there, as a lot of that new development went in, um, the city asked those developers to, to turn that over to the municipal utility. So there are some examples. There's also two irrigation districts in the Central Valley that have been trying to municipalize. Um, but yes, acquiring PG&E's infrastructure is, is very challenging, and it's, it's not something we're recommending at this time. Yeah, and I'm sure my friend, our friends at PG&E wouldn't like it if I say that the reason that we're still operating probably mostly on the 30s and 40s and 50s infrastructure, and that's why we're experiencing many of the outages that we get, right? Um, so I'm, I just want to make sure I understand. There's two elements to this. One is a microgrid, which we can do regardless of who the utility is. And, I, and there's no question that downtown West intends to be on a microgrid regardless of the decision of the utility. Is that correct? Um, that's, that is correct. I think the question is the scale of that microgrid and how much they can do. Under current uh, CPUC rules, um, you know, power cannot cross the, the right-of-way, right? They're not allowed to do that. So the scale of the microgrid that they can install would be much smaller if they took pg and &E service. And so, when you say the right of way. So that would mean like streets or, so they can't cross over public streets with, with the electrical service with the existing PG&E uh, pieces. So they'd have to island particular blocks of the development, but wouldn't be able to do the whole development in total and get the, the advantages of the distributed energy and the, and the overall microgrid. They wouldn't be able to have one microgrid covering the entire development. They'd have to have multiple microgrids or just choose to microgrid certain part portions of it. Is that right? Correct. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, the graph on page 24 has a picture of um, solar, of the production of energy is projected for downtown west over time. Is that right? Um, and it had sort of an element that was solar. Well, I assume that, that that little slice that was solar meant on site local solar, not necessarily overall solar power that they'd be procuring or using. Is that right? Yes, uh, that, that is correct. That is meant to describe the solar that is actually on site at the development. Um, we would expect, and that was what was modeled, is that we would supply the rest of the energy with clean energy, and that might come from solar, but not locally. Okay. Yeah. And that's just because the, of the capacity that their, that their footprint has for a certain amount of solar? It, that's, limit, that's the amount that it's limited to if, we were, if they were to use solar on as much of their, their facilities as they... 
Yeah, so it's really a function that the development is very vertical. Um, so tall buildings, they can put solar on the roof, but they still have a lot okay. of load for those buildings, right, versus um, something that was just more spread out and, and could accommodate more solar. And because of the kind of work they're doing there with computation and everything else uses a lot of energy, right? Yeah, and, and just the scale of yeah. the development, just the number of buildings there that, that use that. I wouldn't say it's necessarily their particular use, okay. but just, yeah. just how big the development and they were, is. They were talking about, I think I remember a presentation where they were talking about using um, other kinds of energy generation on site as well from their you know, contained garbage systems and things like that and uh, potentially, so it's not just solar that they'd be doing on site? Yeah, Jim, do you wanna take that question? Um, currently, the only energy source that is contemplated on site is solar. Uh, there's not enough wind resource to make that, that work. Uh, you could envision something else other than that. Uh, there's currently no plans other than that. There is a significant uh, uh, ability to uh, store, thermal storage with the with this district system and this and the central heating and cooling that that you have a lot of that energy that you can pre not only pre-cool the buildings but you can store it in the system itself and that acts as as additional resources that can work you through a thing so but but really today the only practical technology is solar uh, in the future you you know the you could consider anything. I was wondering if they, I thought I heard something about cogeneration on site as well, but I'm not sure. Uh, the decision has been made to include no cogeneration, no fossil. There is not going to be, there is no gas lines in the development period. So there is no fossil on site, except for the uh, emergency backup generators, which are required by code for things like emergency lighting, elevators, that sort of thing. Okay. That's the only fossil that's on site. Okay, thank you. So what is the process that has to happen um, with the state, the PUC, legally, et cetera, to form a utility then, a public utility? <clears throat> yeah, so the process is really locally. It's um, revisions to our own municipal code uh, to form uh, the utility and start serving it. So, you know, we did a lot in collaboration with the city attorney's office, a lot of research on that, that feasibility. Um, but that, that ultimately is the step. Now there are, uh, you know, as you might expect, there are regulations that the city has to comply with, both federal and state, but in terms of foring, forming it, it is under local control. Okay. Um, in order to deliver this energy, it, it you know comes from if we if, for example I assume we'd be providing it through San Jose Clean Energy, and we'd, we'd be coming on through a through a backbone that's not necessarily in our control. Obviously, it's a, a backbone that still is controlled by Kaiso, um, and we have to be able to tie directly into a Kaiso line then in order to have this work. Um, you don't have to, but it definitely makes it more cost effective to connect at the transmission level service. If we connected at distribution level service, then um, the development would have to pay distribution level charges to PG&E, mm -hmm. and so it's just much more economical to connect at the transmission system. Um, in terms of your first question, um, yes, uh, we would still have to contract for generation, just like we do for San Jose Clean Energy. Um, you know, as you know, those electrons just flow where they flow, but very important that we have enough supply to supply the load there, which is the same as, you know, for the CCA today. And after we tap into that backbone, we need our own substation then in order to, to you know, there, there's no need for that. You just can come right off the backbone and go straight into the microgrid. At, at yeah, Doug, do you want to take that question? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, the, the developer would build a, a small customer substation that you know comparable to what a small city load uh, would have a substation. So they They'll will have a substation on site. Yes, it'll be on site. They would then turn that over, and the city will own that substation. So the city will connect to the transmission system, and then uh, the power would be transformed to just distribution voltage and delivered across the the whole development. So from a financial risk standpoint. 
we are, we are under the expectation that Google would be paying for the building of that substation and all of the other infrastructure that's, right. that's needed there. And Is then they would hand it over to the city. Yeah, and, that, and that's typical regardless. So developers put in that infrastructure, and really the question is, do they turn it over to PG&E, or do they turn it over to the city to own and operate? But in all cases, the developer would put in that infrastructure. We've talked about this potentially being expandable, so that if there's a new development, let's say in North San Jose or in downtown, and we want our municipal utility to provide energy there, we'd have to have either a, a second substation or there have to be excess capacity at the one that is built up downtown west? Yeah, it, it depends on where that location is. If it was in close proximity, it may be able to be served from there. Um, if it was further away, we'd have to check the location to the transmission system and see what infrastructures were required. And, you know, you, you have to step down the voltage, just maybe to put this in plain language, transmission systems are high voltage. They go across the state. Think of them like a freeway, mm -hmm. <laughs> a highway. The distribution system you can think of as like the road to your house, right? It connects that to your house, and that's served at lower voltage. Um, so, so we would need to build our own distribution system to the other developments that occur in order to have it be served by from our utility. Right, and in, in, in this case, the developer is installing that distribution system. Locally, but I'm talking about if right. we this, because my next question, series of questions would be about the expandability of this. Right. If we're doing this, it's not necessarily, well, it might be just for the benefit of downtown West, but there might be a benefit in considering what our long-term goals are for delivery at other new developments and whether we have, we're building an infrastructure that can support that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So right now we're very focused on just this development because it's funded by this developer, but certainly to the future, um, you know, it's, it's possible, but I think what we would say is we'd, we'd have to look at that location and look at the technical feasibility. But we, okay, I, I guess we're, we're too early in this to really get into these detailed questions maybe, <laughs> but I mean, I'm just thinking that we'd want to be considering some of this as we proceed now because it's one thing to say in the future we might look into it, but if we haven't prepared for it, it'll yes. be less likely than if we prepare for it during this, this development now of the process. Okay, and, and then just the last question before I um, end for now. Um, you know, we, we're still at the mercy, I mean, this idea that there's fewer outages, we're still at the mercy of the backbone, which may, presumably, you know, is a, is, is a fairly more, is more reliable in our area than the distribution system, so I understand that we would have fewer outages but we still have the potential that the backbone itself is, can be impacted or um, rolling blackouts, et cetera, would still be an issue because we still would be receiving our power off that backbone. Um, or because we're a microgrid, I guess a lot of the energy on site could still be, there should be some battery storage on site as backup. Is that partly yeah, the Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct there. So um, number one, it's a little bit more reliable in that there is some on-site generation, and so that's helpful. Um, but you're right, uh, a lot of the power would be delivered from the transmission system if there was a transmission outage, which is pretty uncommon, but it can happen. Typically when that happens, it's up in the um, rural areas, you know, and there's a fire burning or something like that where it would be de-energized in an urban area, you know, very unlikely that a transmission system would go down. And then important to note, there's multiple transmission lines that serve San Jose, and that is um, designed to meet federal standards for reliability. So if one line goes down, there's other transmission lines that serve San Jose and can accommodate that. And that's common across all urban centers. So, but you're right, um, you know, if, a, if multiple transmission lines went down, um, you know, there, that area could, you know, experience an outage. And Kaiso right now has RFPs out to put in two new transmission lines into our city that'll be underground, is that right? Right, so there's two new transmission lines, one going um, near Metcalf, where that substation is today, um, into downtown, and another one um, coming from the north uh, near where the wastewater treatment plant is. So there is a plan across California to expand transmission lines. Okay. All right, thank you. That's my questions for now. Thank you. Councilmember Jimenez? Yeah, thank you. I, I, uh, I'll premise my questions with, uh, you know, some of the stuff's a little confusing. <laughs> There's a lot going on, and I appreciate uh, Councilmember Cohen's questions. They help sort of enlighten me a little bit as to some of the things that, that I was curious about. Um, uh, one of the questions, the first question I have is, I, I know in the memo, I think on page two, it, it went through, and this stands out at me as, as one of the main things I remember from the many discussions we had, is that uh, 
uh, on March 25th, 2021, I think there was a, there was a study session in which I believe it was provided through three options. One was PG&E retail community microgrid enablement program service, and then the other option was city provided service, which I think it seems like what we're mostly discussing here. And then three was private Google provided service. And so, can you remind me, was that a decision for the city to make as to how we wanted to proceed, or those were the three possibilities? And if those were the three possibilities. I'm curious what the current status is of that. I mean, is Google still having conversations with PG&E, for example? I mean, how's that playing out? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll answer briefly and then maybe <laughs> um, ask Nancy to come down, but I think I can get this one. So uh, Google's still considering all the options. Um, and so, you know, PG&E is a default, so certainly they're working with PG&E, especially in the event that the city decided not to provide, not to form um, a city utility to provide the service, they need an option. Their third option is, you know, providing the service themselves is actually not possible right now due to state law. Um, it was included in there in the event that they could get state approval for that, but to my knowledge, they have not yet. Okay, and so since, since the only Two options seem to be based on your answer is PG&E, Community Microgrid, Name and Program Service, and then the city service. The other one they can't necessarily do right now. How does that conversation that they're having with PG&E impact the way we move forward, if at all? So as I said, the really nice thing is, you know, there's a number of startup actions we can take. Um, and... You know, ultimately, if in a couple of years they think it's better to take PG&E service, you know, there's no harm. They're funding all of this work, so we could, you know, amend the Muni code to be able to provide that service. We could do some design standards and rules and regs. And, you know, if at some point they said to us through the funding agreement, no, I want to take it from PG&E, you know, how that works today is they fund all of our costs. And as long as they're, you know, we're, we're covered there in terms of all of the startup work, they can decide to um, take service from pg &E, and our recommendation obviously would be not to provide service because we don't have startup funding there um, to do that um, because there is significant risk that, you know, if the city was to go out and raise capital for that startup funding and then that load didn't show up, um, you know, we would be at risk for that, so it wouldn't be something I'd recommend. Um, but there would still be benefits to the city. Um, you know, as we've talked about, there's possibilities for new development, so some of that work would be applicable to another new developer if they wanted to come along and explore this option with us. So I would say there's still positive benefits in proceeding, even though we don't know exactly where this all will end up over the next five years. Okay. I think one of the challenges I've had in many of these conversations we've had around this topic is that on the one hand, we're having a discussion specifically about this microgrid downtown west but I feel like sort of uh, it, that sits within the broader conversation of do we as a city want to go down this road? And I'm having trouble understanding and separating out sort of the decision points and where whether your interpretation of the direction we've given is clearly the city wants to go start our own new utility company or not. Or, 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 or is it the other sense I'm getting is that we want to set ourselves up to the possibility, assuming we choose to in the future, to, 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 to the mayor's memo on this, you know, to create some regs and such. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, to, to sort of set us up in case we decide to go down that road. I'm trying to understand sort of how you see it and, and how you're interpreting the direction coming from the council. Yeah, so, so as I started, you know, we've had a lot of direction from the council to explore options for resiliency. Um, so we've, we've done a lot of the work on that. And, you know, our staff recommendation is that you know, this to do this study, we've concluded we do think it's possible, it's viable, um, could provide a lot of benefits, both cost and reliability benefits. So our recommendation is to go ahead and proceed with these startup actions. Um, you know, our expectation of where the council will weigh in, the next, you know, obviously accepting the report today, your vote there is important to us to understand where the council is on this. And then, um, you know, when we bring forward these municipal code revisions, um, you know, obviously the council, that's a key decision, you know, do you want to be in this business? Not unlike the action that the council took to form San Jose Clean Energy, right, with Title 26. Of course, that was before I was here, um, but that was a milestone moment to be in the city. It didn't automatically put you in that business quite yet because there was a lot of operating agreements that still needed to come, um, but that happened very quickly because it was just a different line of business. You know, this one um, is really tied to the construction out there, so right. we do need to check along the way that it's it's viable. 
Okay, and, and I guess to the presentation as an example, you know, there, there was a lot of information uh, in the presentation, but some of it was, um, I'm just going to it now. Um, just the, sorry, let me just get to it. It's, um, trying to remember, um, the, the economic analysis, the assumption, things of that nature. I gotta go back and, <laughs> there was a lot of information there going back and look at the slides, but it seemed to me that a lot of that was tied to specifically this site, not necessarily citywide, right? And so that's why, I, that's, to my point, that's where some of the, I think. It, if I could, I, I think it's just, this is, this is an interesting uh, space to think about. So the way that I was thinking about it as the team has educated me into this is we've got a couple of decision points. And the reason that we made this a, a special meeting rather than a study session is we did intentionally want you to give us a, a signal that you want us to move forward to the next step. We don't believe that that next step commits us to this line of work, but it does say we would like you to begin to do the work necessary to bring back the recommendations to become a power provider. And in, in, in essence, that question of do we do it for the city or do we do it for this development are tied up in this single development. So if you were to approve it for this, the answer would be yes on both questions, but you would not have made the determination, do we ever scale beyond that? because it, it, the, the entity that we would set up, the project that we would do would be for this 80 acres, very significant amount of land. We think that's self-sufficient, self-sustainable, and if that's the only thing we ever do, we think that's a good business deal. We do think there's opportunities down in the future to evaluate expanding that, but we would come back to you just as we're coming back today and make those questions and considerations in, uh, only with council direction to expand. So in my mind, today is to say, keep exploring it, when we come back with the Muni code, that's saying we're serious about creating our powers and capabilities of doing this. And we'll come back with the agreements with the partner to move down to provide it for your approval that we want to go down this road together. And, and the moment you do that, you're also improving the larger idea that yes, we are a power provider for the city, but not any more beyond than beyond the boundaries of those 80 acres. If, let me yeah. stop to make sure I didn't skate out too far because I'm learning <laughs> into this as well. No, that, that actually helps sort of, in my mind, disaggregate sort of what we're doing and that helps me gain a better understanding. Uh, Lori, when, when do we expect to come back, or anyone, uh, expect to come back with those regs? Is, I think of the mayor's memo, he's asking to come back before the end of the year and so. Yeah, that, that's our expectation. We've been working on it and um, you know that's very important to the developer. As you know, they have options, but you know they need to build things and they need to know, you know what options are really real and so. Um, you know, we we do uh, think that that's a realistic time frame and could come back to, at that time. How, how do you envision, wh what is the go, no, go moment, if you will, for the development, right? Because uh, I, I, I thought, I think just based on something you said earlier, that irrespective of whether they turn that over to the city or to PG&E, they're going to build out what they're going to build out. How do they approach the development differently, if assuming the city's interested in getting involved in the business? Um, it gives them design flexibility. Okay. And to, to put it in context, if you look at the uh, facility that they just built, the Bayview facility that we got a tour up, up, up on Mountain View, they have done some of the most extraordinary and elegant and beautiful and complex engineering around energy and energy distribution and energy resilience. Um, I think that has probably ever been done anywhere, certainly in North America and perhaps on the face of the planet. None of that is possible for this kind of development without uh, us looking at, at variations from the code, variation from the book, if you will, um, and our ability to do that as a smaller entity is, is high. Uh, Google was able to do that where they were because NASA was their partner, uh, and NASA obviously has both an interest in the high level of innovation and the engineering to, to work alongside them, but they would be, uh, in my opinion, tremendously restricted in what their vision is and unable to attain their vision unless they have that degree of design flexibility that we would be able to offer them. And do you, do you is the is the thought that they expect or they would it would be they would expect that design flexibility to come before the end of the year that 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 decision point or, or that that's not there's not a hard deadline there no um, okay. that that work would definitely be slated for 2023 okay all right and so I, I I suspect I know the answer to this but I'm going to ask it anyway but you all would characterize this as an important decision <laughs> right. 
Yes, the very, very much so. <laughs> right, That's why right. we scheduled it as a special meeting. <laughs> correct, correct. And yeah. so, and so, I knew that answer. And so, um, <laughs> one of the reasons I asked that because one of the things that, to be honest with you, that gives me pause is that just in, in just a few months, we're we're literally at the footstep of a new administration. Whoever's elected to become the next mayor, we're going to get at the very least three new council members. Um, and I understand that there's a steep learning curve that I'm sure you're, you're, you're witnessing just even by some of the questions, but some of that's still gonna need to be overcome even if with the new council, right? Because some of the agree, some of the other things, important components of this are gonna have to come back next year. Um, and so what gives me a little bit of pause is making this decision now, essentially lo seemingly locking in the new council to this particular direction, right? Um, and, and so, um, I'm a little concerned about that, um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there. I'm not sure if others share that concern, but I wanted to express that. And and uh, but but those are all the questions I have. Um, I think there's a lot more to to better understand here, but I look forward to hearing from some of the other uh, my other colleagues and the mayor on this topic. But I, I thank you for all the work and all the information. I appreciate it. So I just want to pop, uh, pop in here and uh, thank you for the questions because this is an important. Uh, meeting here to get to really start understanding the depths of this but this particular you know why we're doing this is, is very important to this project and it, which is important too as we go into some economic uncertainty about the viability of the project and so I appreciate the questions but I just want to make sure um, everybody understands in the audience that uh, this, this is particularly important for this huge development as we uh, explore this further. Can I ask a question just on, on that, um, Jennifer? I guess what I'm curious about is, is, is it uh, just the way I interpreted your statement, Jennifer, but are, are we, is there a suggestion being put on the table that we're, we're, we're putting this development at risk if we don't make a decision today and point you in a particular direction today? Is that, is that? That's for you. <laughs> I know I'm going to say that no, um, because again, we're we're just asking we're, we want to go down a further study route on this. Um, and, and again, we're not this is not the final go no go or anything. But I think it's important that we uh, dive deeper in this and continue to to work on this to see what the future may hold and the future even beyond this particular project could be if you saw the rate savings that's um, that you were shown on the screen earlier could be very important let's say for the water pollution control plant and future rate payer savings, if we can really lower our costs out there, the airport, as we try to attract more uh, businesses to the, and airplane service to the airport. So it has wide reaching economic potential benefit to the city. So again, just want to encourage us to continue to look at this. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I have to admit those obviously the slides that were up there, that obviously I suspect this is for all council members. One of the appealing things about it is the lower cost that were sort of put out there as it relates to you know uh, municipal owned utilities versus independently owned utilities. So I, I acknowledge that and think that's a very important part of it. So that, that I think that's where the oh, you know what, what's the best choice. So thank you. Thank you, and I'll just maybe I could offer my own perspective. I talked to a senior official at the company today. Um, and there was no suggestion that somehow or another their decisions are contingent on our decision today. We didn't actually talk about today, but, but I, I guess I would offer that <clears throat> in the larger environment, I, I know you're well aware, Council Member, we're looking at rapidly rising interest rates. Um, we're looking at a very uncertain economy with inflation that has not been tamed and a lot of reasons for a lot of companies to pull back, a lot of good reasons for companies to pull back. And it is a difficult decision to continue pushing forward uh, with a very large capital expenditure at the time that perhaps 10 months from now when many of these companies, many tech companies may be laying off uh, workers. And that's a very difficult decision then to say to the C-suite and to say to your employees, we're gonna continue to move forward. And so I, I think uh, it is important for us to demonstrate as a city that we're willing to move forward uh, as fast as we need to, if we agree, if we agree that this is a good thing for the city, both this and the larger project. Now, we've already made a decision about the larger project. We unanimously approved it. But if we, we agree, at least this is worth exploring. And I think you were hearing that there's, this is not a point of no return. Uh, we can always pull back. Um, that 
that this would be really important for us to demonstrate that we can move at the speed they need to uh, because we don't want to give them any reason <laughs> why they should maybe hit the pause button or slow down. And I, I just, again, I'm not, there's no threat out there. There's no sword hanging over anybody's head. I think there is just the reality of what we see in the economy. And this is a moment when, when companies are saying they're willing to expand, we don't want to give them any reason to say, well, let me think about it. Um, uh, let's go to uh, online. Uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thanks so much for Lori for the, the briefing ahead of time. So most of my questions have been answered, but I keep going back to um, mitigating risks and who takes on the risk. I know that the developer is going to take on all of the startup uh, costs, but why wouldn't we ask the developer to mitigate all risk as opposed to just a portion of the risk? Um, yeah, that's a great question, council members. So if we go back to the risk that we identified, you know, I think um, there are really four. Um, you know, one is the benchmark rate. Um, and so that essentially is where is PG&E's rates going? And that isn't it's not really something that the developer controls, but in some ways they do own that risk by by funding the startup cost. So, if they fund the startup and uh, rates are above, you know that delays their repayment of those startup costs. In terms of the other risk, the staffing levels, that's also something that they don't control. That's something that we control when we hire, but obviously very important that we coordinate with them to make sure that we align hiring with that construction schedule so that we keep costs competitive. And then I would say the final one, um, you know, really is regulatory risk around non-bypassable charges and other charges that, you know, could occur. And really they are owning that risk and that they're funding the startup costs, um, but we're being good partners and that, you know, we recommend that it's great to, to go ahead and check those rates before we provide service. So if there is a regulatory change that makes it not competitive, um, you know, that we're making the the right decision there for the rate payers in that development. Yeah, and, and you know, first of all, I wanna say that, you know, I'm very supportive of exploring this. I think it's a, a very intriguing uh, proposition, but I also know, Lori, um, that, you know, you're, you're great at what you do and you're a, a subject matter expert, but, you know, we've been, um, surprised and encountered uh, different issues that have come up that have made you know the business more challenging and we don't know what we don't know and so um, if there's a way to to put in language in the agreement to um, further mitigate some of the potential exposure I think that you know that would give me a, a greater comfort level and I'm sure my colleagues as well and if uh, if the developer thinks that you know um, this is a, a viable proposition and there's not a lot of risk to the city to, to move forward, then you know, hopefully there wouldn't be a lot of resistance to incorporating some type of uh, additional uh, requirements to, to mitigate or actually eliminate our, our risk. But that's a, that is a concern that I still have. Is that something that is possible to, to bring up in the conversation or incorporate in your negotiations? Yeah, no, that, that's a good point and certainly something we can talk with them about. Um, you know, I would say it's a it's just a huge opportunity that they are willing to fund the startup costs, which is great. It's a very unique. Um, and, you know, just to make sure we're all clear on what those startup costs are, you know, currently they're funding the staff time to work on this. Um, but also what we imagine is not only that, but the capital cost to fund a reserve, um, which is in the report, to take care of any um, operations and maintenance needs that the utility might have in those early years while it's building a reserve. But you make a good point. It, you know, it is something we can work with them on. And as you saw in the timeline, that agreement wouldn't come forward to council likely until 2023. So it's certainly something we can explore. And if I could add, uh, council, uh, Vice Mayor, this is Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. I think that the to your point of not knowing what we don't know, the biggest way to mitigate that risk is to build the small team of people who are the deep, deep experts in this and get them online with Google's funds. 
uh, um, the developers' funds sooner rather than later and have that team able to advise us as we go through the process. And so I think we've got that in as part of the plan. And, and as you can see from, and it remarked from the quality team here, a few very, very talented people can go a long way if they really know what they're doing. And so bringing, making sure that we're able to attract and retain that level of talent throughout this project is one of our key ways of mitigating the risk. And that's, that's something that the existing approach would allow us to do and that we should be uh, aggressive on. No, and I definitely hear you. And, and But one of the things I've learned, Kip, uh, over our you know, last couple of years and are going through this process is even with some of the smartest and brightest people that they're, we're constantly being hit with uh, unexpected you know, issues and, and problems. So that, that's where a lot of my concern is coming from. And um, so, uh, Lori, again, um, if there's any way uh, that we can incorporate that as part of the negotiation, uh, that would be my my preference. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you. Uh, this is really a complicated issue that I'm trying to get my head around, and I I hear the desire to get something back to us in December, but I'm frankly a little bit concerned about that. But uh, so I'll just ask my my questions and, and share my thoughts. I, I, I'm a little concerned about the city going into the utility business beyond what we're already doing with SJ Clean Energy. So I'll just lay that out there as my benchmark of where I'm coming from that uh, and, and I'm concerned about the impact financially on our general fund. So I want to get into that a little bit. Lori and others, you thank you for the report, by the way. Uh, you've mentioned many times that the developer is going to pay the startup costs. Can you detail what those startup costs are? Uh, what's what? what's the dollar amount we're talking about? And specifically, what does that mean? Is that building the substation? Is that paying for the infrastructure? Is that paying for the staff we need? What is the detail of that? And how many dollars are you estimating that will be? Sure, council member, that, that's a really great question. So today they are funding 100% of the staff time. Um, as we expressed during the presentation what is normal for developers is they would put in the electrical infrastructure and really the question is so they fund that um, fully they construct it and the question is do they turn it over to pg e or do they turn it over to the city to own and operate and then in terms of the startup costs i'm going to um, let doug answer that of what we modeled in our financial model if you don't mind yeah so it, it besides the the cost of the construction, which essentially was assumed to be fully funded by the developer, we we assumed that there was staffing costs. Um, I think there was a, a handful of key staff to start with, senior level staff and engineering staff, so several uh, full-time equivalent employees. And then that uh, ramped up uh, in conjunction with the load. I think the total staffing at, at full, uh, full load was around 14. Uh, full-time equivalent staff um, that's the principal cost is the staffing cost and that would be funded by the developer uh, but would be uh, reimbursed through future uh, revenues once the load was big enough to to support that um, there's other costs in terms of uh, you know some of the costs related to maintenance and as Lori mentioned Sort of pre uh, pre funding a reserve fund, um, so if in the future there were unexpected costs, the 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 biggest risk would be let's say a, the one of the two main transformers if that uh, uh, failed, that would have to be replaced. Um, we assume that the startup cost funding would uh, would support that um, uh, that replacement. Okay, dollar amounts. I haven't heard dollar amounts being thrown out. So if I'm Google, Google's a developer we're talking about, right? If I'm Google, I wanna know what's the cost of these startup costs? What's the cost of the construction? 
what's the maintenance reserve fund, et cetera, et cetera. I, I hear all these names. What, what's the dollar amount? And I know it's an estimate, but I'm just trying to get a handle on millions, billions. What's, what are we talking about? Yeah, all good questions. Um, you know, council member, I think, um, you know, all of that, we did a lot of modeling on that and happy to follow up with you on the ranges in terms of staffing costs. Yes, millions in the, you know, under 10 million likely, but we'll, we'll follow up with those exact numbers in terms of the startup capital. Um, I believe it was in the 20 to $40 million range, but importantly, um, you know, this is a very early action here. All of those costs would be detailed in the business agreement that we expect to bring forward to council next year. So that would detail in detail exactly what the costs are, exactly what they're funding, and exactly what those repayment terms are. Um, so we're just not quite there yet. You know, we're early days and just assessing, um, is this economically viable, if that makes sense? Uh, it does, um, and I'm trying to determine whether it's economically viable from the city's risk, uh, risk and responsibility. So the construction cost, when you use the term capital, you're referring to the construction cost of being 20 to 40 million. Is that no? No. Asking? So let me just be clear. So the construction cost is 100 percent them. Um, in in all okay, scenarios. Okay. So how much is? So they have to do this regardless. Right. Right. And, and the question is, they they construct it and turn it over to PG&E or turn it over to us. So in their mind, it's just like constructing the buildings and everything else in the development. They have to construct that electrical infrastructure as well. OK, so when we're looking at the uh, they're they're paying the upfront, the startup cost to the city, but they're just uh, front loading them, we're reimbursing them as our customers pay yeah. us for the utilities. Yeah, let me be clear, council member. So the construction costs are not being reimbursed. What would be reimbursed is the reserve. So, so maybe- No, I understand. I, I understand. I mentioned startup costs, not construction. Oh, okay. I, I, okay. Yeah, I, I understand that. Okay. Thank you. So, but the, it, you're talking about the startup costs being reimbursed, the staffing reimbursed, the uh, um, infrastructure being inverse, reimbursed. What else is being, what yeah. do we expect to be reimbursed for? Let me get to that more specifically. Yeah, so not the infrastructure. Um, our, our expectation is that they would put that in. They either turn it over to us or to PG&E. So um, to be honest with you, we don't know what those numbers are. Those are you know, Google's own business of how they construct that infrastructure. That would not be reimbursed, those capital costs. What we're talking about is the, the cost that they would put into a reserve to fund the operations and maintenance. Once revenues were sufficient to reimburse them, that's what we are talking about reimbursing them for, just that operations reserve. And the reason for that is if we were an operating utility, utilities have reserves. The issue here is that we're, we're starting up and so there isn't a reserve. And so what we've asked them to do is to go ahead and pre-fund that so that there are funds available in case we need to replace equipment and, and maintain it from that reserve. Does that make sense? Lori, if I could add, I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm, I'm understanding this as well. So the, the developer, um, West Bank, would cover all of the costs for building out the infrastructure as per normal and hand that over to us or pg &E. In addition, they would put up front th their own funding in place to cover our any costs on our side, which we would be drawing down from for operations and maintenance of that over a long period of time. To the extent that we begin to uh, come up on the positive side um, of the cost structure for just that development, this does not include anything, this has nothing to do with community energy. This is a completely separate entity. We're not talking about any citizen ratepayers or any existing businesses or any existing customers in San Jose. So just if we start coming uh, to, a, if you will, profitable isn't the right word, but above the cost to end for that 80 acres itself, then we start to pay from 
from the money that they paid us back into that so that they, they essentially pay themselves back for the cost that they paid up front. But in any case, it's all a circular set of costs from the developer, which they would put in a reserve up front. And if we are successful at saving them money, that gets paid back to them. Is that, is that the way that this particular transaction would work? Yeah. Yes, that was a great description. Thank you, Kip. <laughs> yeah, because part of what part of what gets confusing is this is a this would be starting a completely separate business from community energy and would be a completely separate set of payments and obligations. And we would put uh, seek to put neither the general fund nor the community energy customers within that equation as we as we build out the transaction. Okay. Um, <laughs> all of this goes to how complicated this issue is and how I've read the memo, I've read it twice, and the two times I read it and I heard your presentation, maybe I wasn't listening that closely, but the, the, there's an implication that there, at least this is how I'm interpreting it, it means I have to go back and read it again and make sure I'm right or wrong and, and I'll adjust my uh, uh, theory at, at that time, but it, it seems to me that Google or the, Google's paying a certain amount, getting reimbursed through taxpayer, not taxpayers, through ratepayers, through the load, and over time, and uh, that, and and therefore there is no risk to the city. But I always think that there is some risk to the city. I think the devil is in the details. So I'll yeah. be looking forward to those details um, as they come down, but I, but I hear where you're coming from. My question about the reimbursement is, what if, is, is the agreement going to include a time frame such as, okay, we're going to reimburse you within 10 years, and then what if we don't? What if we don't have, it all depends on the amount of ratepayers we have who are utilizing this uh, grid. If, if I I'm could, using just term one small and distinction. I I want to check with Lori on this. I believe there is actually would be only one rate payer in this case. Our, our, essentially, all the rate payers are limited to the 80 acres of this grid. I want to make sure that I'm clear on that um, and that, that the obligations in terms of, of who we are serving and who would be paying back that would go into the re reimbursement are exclusively limited to the 80 acres of the new development and don't touch any, any customers. Is, is that correct? Any, any new, uh, uh, there'll be customers within the 80 acres. There may be multiple right. rate payers because of the development, but it's only within the 88 acres. That, that's correct. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt council member, but I wanted to make sure we were talking about the same rate payers. Yes, I, that part I did understand. Thank you. <laughs> I, yeah. I, guess I'll, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. So uh, I, I really, you could tell by my question, I really don't have a good handle on this whole issue. Um, it's complicated, but I'm fairly risk averse, so I'm, I'm hesitant to move forward with speed. I'm interested in moving forward, but I'd like to be more thoughtful and uh, speed isn't something I'm interested in right now with this issue because it's so complicated for me to understand. And that's admitted in public how complicated this is for me. So uh, for that, I, I see I've exceeded my 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll move on and let someone else speak. Thank you. Thanks. Um, while other folks maybe think about their questions, I'll, I'll jump in with a few of my own. Uh, uh, Sam, I actually had my hand raised. Vice Mayor? Yes. Uh, uh, Lori and Kip, can you net out what is um, what is the benefit to the developer for for us doing this project and what is the benefit to the city? Can you just net that out for me? Sure. Um, so the benefit to the developer is potentially lower rates for that development. So they would be a rate payer along with the other residents and businesses in the development. The other benefit is design flexibility. So uh, a more advanced micro microgrid, more clean energy there. Those are the two benefits to the developer in terms of to the city. Um, I would say they're similar. Um, so a portion of the city is more reliable. It has cleaner energy. And although it doesn't solve all of the issues that we've discussed in terms of power outages, it is a very important part of the city that at least would be more reliable with more clean energy. 
and those rate payers would have lower rates, which I would say is an overall benefit um, to the city in terms of attracting um, residents and, and developers. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar. I hear it often that Santa Clara's rates are about half of what PG&E is. And although with the CCA, we hope to get to back to a discount next year, um, you know, we would never be able to provide that steep of a discount just being in the generation business um, because distribution is two thirds of the bill. So it's an opportunity to lower bills for residents and to provide more design fl flexibility at the development. And I think the only two things I would add on, on top of that is that from uh, the city perspective, we get the chance to do this right um, with a developer partner who is willing to take the time to do this the right way. And then to the question that, that uh, was asked earlier, we can then make a more informed decision if we want to scale to other areas on a really strong point of departure. Um, the, the other thing on the, uh, on the developer advantage from my perspective is that in addition to just sort of the, the uh, design flexibility, it really gives them the opportunity to do a true signature project. Um, and that's something that that I think is 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 to me very interesting. But it's something I know that they've also expressed uh, in, in terms of how they want to do their work going forward. To make sure that this is really quite uh, revolutionary, and 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 we believe this would allow them the opportunity to do that that would otherwise otherwise not be possible. Okay, so environmentally, uh, it's a benefit to the city. And as far as if this is not a one off, and we're going to replicate this model for other developments, then it sends a clear message that, that the city of San Jose is, is willing to work with uh, potential developers for new projects. Uh, is there any financial benefit to the city to pursue this? There could be. Could as... No, go ahead. Go ahead, Larry. There could be, as I noted, many publicly owned utilities provide payment in lieu of taxes to the local government. Um, those are really meant to um, offset what they otherwise would receive from franchise fees or other utility taxes, but many publicly owned utilities provide benefits beyond that from those rate savings. Yeah, but wouldn't I could just offer, I, I just had a conversation with a CEO three days ago who said, I'm reluctant to expand in San Jose because you don't have public power and you've got transformers that blow and you've got 100,000 people who are without power. And I, I'd like to go to a city like Palo Alto or Santa Clara where I know they're gonna invest in the infrastructure, the local infrastructure. I, I, that was just all I wanted to offer or Vice Mayor Jones, that this is an economic and financial issue for us in terms of the viability of the future of our city because we continue to be dependent on a utility that's going to invest 40 billion dollars probably in undergrounding transmission distribution lines rather than prioritizing the infrastructure replacement in our own city and we've seen that time and again since 2020 and certainly before yeah i, I appreciate that uh mayor and if um if this is not just a one-off which could very well be, then then that's a, that's a great point in terms of the messages that we're sending to the rest of the business community. Um, could could be uh, a one off, or an, it could not be. Uh, we don't know what the future holds, but I think it's important for us to have a clear understanding as we go into this. You know what the benefit is to the city, and you articulated one benefit, and I appreciate that. And that's all, all the questions I have. Thank you. Thanks. I, I wanted to pick up where Vice Mayor Jones left off because I think that's a really important point. Is this a one-off or not? And, and this is really important because regardless of whatever Google does or doesn't do, we had this issue about moving forward with microgrids come before this council. And, and Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we unanimously voted to move forward to explore how we could deploy microgrids in the city. Is, is that right? That's correct. And, and the, the the point of that was at the time we were dealing with grid resilience issues as we are today. And literally this is our only way out. I mean, we either move forward and try to create microgrids in our city with more local generation, more local storage, or we continue to be subject to the whims of entities that are not very accountable to us 
uh, are not terribly accountable to anybody, frankly, uh, and to their failing infrastructure. And so the idea was, and I think the council was pretty united on this, was we need to look at microgrids and lots of other cities are doing it and they're doing it for their fire stations, they're doing it for their essential functions. Uh, if you go up the road to Fremont, I think they've got three fire stations that are off the grid now with, uh, with, with their own microgrids. And so we saw, look, we're looking for opportunities to do this and it happens to be challenging and it's complex. And we saw a partner out there in Google who's willing to front all the development costs uh, and an awful lot of the upfront costs and absorb an enormous amount of the risk to help us do what we wanted to do anyway, which was let's see if we can get a microgrid in place to try to demonstrate that this is gonna give us that resilience advantage. And not only do we get that resilience advantage, it looks like we get a lot of other advantages like cost advantages and economic advantages as well. And so I, I just, I think it's important for us to keep our, our eyes on the big picture, which is we can continue to wait and hope and pray that everybody else is gonna solve our problems for us, or we can actually take the initiative to move forward as we said we would do back in 2019 to try to get microgrids off the ground. And in this case, we're not, again, we're not at any point of no return. We're just at a point where we can actually start to put together some regs, explore all the risks, explore all the, the, the downside risks. I think Council Member uh, Foley and Vice Mayor Jones very appropriately identify that we need to make sure we fully explore and make sure we've got strong agreements. But it feels an awful lot to me like this is where we were with San Jose Clean Energy a few years ago. And there was a lot of hesitation. I know I heard it from from, from lots of folks about what are the risks to the city and appropriately so, there, we have to fully analyze those risks. But the only way you can do that is if you're actually moving forward and learning and delving into it. If we don't come back with regs, if we don't come back with any of the, any of the, the analysis, um, we're not gonna be able to uh, really understand this enough to move forward or to decide there's a better path. And, and I, I just think it's important for us while we're in a position where we have the ability to move backward, to at least be able to move forward, to give ourselves that choice, give ourselves that choice. Um, and in particular, I, I know this is not part of the study. This wasn't part of the analysis, but you know, I've been talking to other city officials about, hey, what are the opportunities here if we could get other city assets into this microgrid? We've got an arena right next door, which would make, as we know, is an important mass care center for any emergency. Uh, if we're gonna have an earthquake and we need to move 10,000 people somewhere, uh, that's gonna be a pretty critical place for us or a convention center for that matter, or an airport. All those are within close vicinity. And I guess I'd like to understand what exactly are the steps for us in terms of regulatory or other steps that we would need assuming that we had the will to go invest in the infrastructure ourselves, to go put in the, the poles or underground, the wires, whatever it might be, um, to expand a microgrid like this to ensure that those essential assets could be part of the microgrid. Could you help us understand what that might be? Sure, those are all really good questions. So I would say the, the first step is, um, you know, the same as to serve this, you know, first is amending the muni code to actually form a municipal utility. If we wanted to serve other city assets, um, you know, then that is infrastructure that we'd have to construct and connect. Um, likely we would need revenue bond authority for that, which typically does need to go to the voters. So that's something we would need to do to raise financing for that. But it's, it's certainly something we could explore, probably a lot easier to first start with this development and then connect load over time. Right. Um, but certainly something we could we could look at. I don't know, Doug, if you had any um, anything else you wanted to expand on there. I mean, I, I think you hit the main point. So once the, the city has formed the utility, then you, you already have the right under the state law and your city charter to do this. And then it, you're just taking council action to serve whichever load it you decide you want to serve within your city boundaries. 
So if the Delmas Park neighborhood, the Market Alma Den neighborhood decide, and they're right on the fringe of this area, right, that they'd really like to take advantage of the lower cost, what all we need to do is make sure we'd have the capital money to expand um, distribution service. Is that right? Th that's right. And, you know, it's possible that there would be enough capacity within the facilities built to serve downtown West to serve some additional load. But at some point, you would need to uh, be looking at constructing a, a larger substation or a substation to serve those, that other load, particularly okay. if it's further away. And I, I know that I'm, I'm probably not the only one who was disappointed to see that we could only get something less than eight megawatts hour solar uh, in this area. I think Councilmember Cohen raised that question, if I'm not mistaken. And maybe it's 20% of the load. Is that right? Jim, do you want to? No, again. Oh, no, the load is what, 40? 40, 40 megawatts. Yeah. Um, so eight. You know, 40, there, there's 20%. 80 acres, and there's only so many photons of energy that fall on 80 acres. Yeah, right. And then when you talk about this being vertical and you talk about it having a, a green space, that means that there's a lot of solar energy that's not being converted. Yeah, it's going to change. You know, the, the, the 7.8 megawatts of solar on site for the development is aggressive. It's possible that they could get maybe 10, 11, something like that. The more they get, then it tends to not make as much energy because it doesn't see the sun quite as well. What I think you're looking for here when you're trying to get the energy is, is you're saying that um, you, you have a lot of parking lots close to this development. You can put solar on those parking lots. You can you can bring energy into the development that doesn't rely on the uh, on the broader grid. Uh, but for those 80 acres, Google, believe me, they are trying as hard as they can to cram as much energy as they can. There are clearly other things that you could do besides solar. Uh, None of those today uh, are meet the requirements of being cost effective and also uh, no GHG. Uh, in the future, uh, there's a lot of talk about green hydrogen. There's talk about modular nuclear. There's talk about all kinds yeah. of things that you could do in the future. But th this, is, this is what the technology allows us to do right now on that site. Yeah. But clearly, we can expand the microgrid to serve more load adjacent by, by constructing facilities adjacent to the development. Okay. Yeah, because I'm thinking, for example, of developers today who are coming to us saying, hey, can we tap into your sewer line on right. 5th Street and go use the methane to generate energy for our building? Um, I imagine right. those kinds of things could be open to this entity, um, obviously, at the right price. That's right. Okay. So I think I hear what you're saying. You, you had to put together a conservative analysis based on what is, um, not maybe what may be, uh, and what we got is that conservative analysis. Yeah, to, to be clear, those numbers actually came from the developers, so it wasn't something that uh, we created. We just took their assumptions of what they're going to build there. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then... You know, you pointed to the, 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 the benefits of public power, and there are many, and I hear it all the time because I talk to the mayor of Sacramento and the mayor of LA, and I'm very jealous of what they're able to do because they have public power there, um, not to mention more local cities like Santa Clara, uh, and what they're able to, the benefits they're able to, to be able to bring to the community in terms of local investment and so forth. But then you, you mentioned Kauai, and my understanding is that wasn't actually public, that was actually a cooperative. I think you mentioned that. It was, uh, it was actually customer-owned, uh, ratepayer-owned, is that right? Correct. So had we considered a ratepayer-owned facility or utility here, if we were to assume ultimately San Jose would be one of those ratepayers if we've got streets going through, for example, we need to pay for streetlights. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I assume we're paying for the streetlight 
uh, service. Is that right? Uh, so this study just looked at the load at downtown West, but there's streetlights there. So yes, it would serve yeah. those as well. Okay. Right. And then potentially if we wanted to expand it, there would be other rate payers and you could form a cooperative like we have in, in, in Kauai and many, many other rate payer owned utilities throughout the country. Is there a reason why we wouldn't want to consider that as a model? Um, a cooperative, um, it's something we, we could consider, but again, that wouldn't be under the councils. That would be a whole new entity right. um, that would be formed by those. So it would just be a different decision body. So that's why we didn't look at it for this. In terms of what's actually under the city's control, you could serve it as a publicly owned utility. If a group of- um, Well, we might be one of those customers, right? That would want to form that. Sure, sure. I guess the reason why I raise it is, you know, there are those who suggest that maybe elected bodies like councils may not be the best decision makers for rates either. Um, and, and there are a lot of folks in those cooperatives that are pretty happy with the cooperatives. Uh, the rate payers control the rates and um, they make the decisions. So is there like a, is there a regulatory reason why we wouldn't or? No, it, it just isn't something that, um you know, we looked at in terms of the quickest possible path to kind of keep up with the construction. You know, we looked yeah. at what's under the city's control, which is forming a publicly owned utility. There are other organizational structures, you're, you're correct, a co-op, um, even a municipal utility district, that's how Sa Sacramento is organized. Um, so they serve beyond the actual city limits of the city of Sacramento, um, and they're governed by a municipal utility district board. Um, Again, that, that entity would have to be started up and, and formed in order to serve it that way. Yeah. Okay, Th thank you for that, Lori. So that would be a question that we could theoretically explore with the developer if there was any interest. Then the last thing, just about ex expanding this, because I, I think ultimately if this gets up and running, there are gonna be a lot of neighbors who would love to be in it, um, particularly given how hard it is to do undergrounding these days. And I guess my question would be, do those Rule 20 fees that are paid uh, in, by development throughout the city, can they be used by this entity just as PG&E can use them? The 20A or 20B fees for undergrounding. I don't know, Doug, if you know that question. Um, my understanding, those fees are collected um, by PG&E's rate payers and then doled out. And so because we would no longer be PG&E distribution rate payers, I don't think they would be available. But Doug, I thought developers paid those. No? Yeah. Could ask uh, our public works director, Matt Kano, to come down oh, and help go. us sort hey, out Matt. the intricacies <laughs> of undergrounding financing. <laughs> Public works structure so that Lori's correct, those are the 20A. There's also the 20B fees, which are the developer funds. Okay, so let's go to the 20B fees since those are the developer funds. Um, if, and I know we've done some aggregating of those funds from other parts of the city where we think we can move forward with an undergrounding project, right? Is there a reason why it, they would be limited to being used only by PG&E? For example, if we had a public owned utility, could that utility take advantage of those 20B funds? Yeah, that's a great question, Mayor. Something we'd have to look into okay. whether we can use the twenty B funds we have remaining that we collect from developers in the in the separate service area. So I don't know the answer to that, but we can follow up. Okay, I just I'm just thinking about again the potential expansion of public power here, which to me is I, I would assume um, you know what publicly owned utilities do is have the developer pay in. Um, you know, to underground other departments. So they wouldn't pay it to PG&E, they would pay it directly to the city. And that, that might be something that could be brought forward in, in that business agreement with the developer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Appreciate all your answers to the questions. Um, let's go back to the council. I know council members Jimenez and Cohen, you have your hands up. Is that from before? Oh, you'd like to go back? Sure. Okay, council member Cohen. Let me, let me just start. Um, a lot of things that were triggered by a lot of the comments. I, I want to be sure. I think there's. I want to be sure that we're clear. And I, some things that, that the mayor said that I think are not quite, quite right. <laughs> and I want to make sure we fully have a neutral understanding of this. He mentioned microgrids and the fact that the, we voted to do microgrids, and we did have this conversation at the beginning of my questioning before. We can do microgrids on our community centers, on our libraries, on our airport. We can do a, a microgrid on our 
uh, emergency operations center, which I think we already committed to doing, regardless of a utility. So we just want to be sure these are two different issues, whether we do microgrid or whether we do a municipal utility. And I just, just confirm that again for me. You're correct. I think it's the scale of the microgrid right. that you could do um, without a city-owned utility. For example, if there were city buildings adjacent to each other that crossed the street, we wouldn't be able to connect those buildings. But the buildings, you know, there certainly we could put a smaller microgrid. So and we really committed to a couple of community centers already. We committed, or at least we had on a roadmap. I, we might not have committed to them. Yeah, yeah we, we don't have funding. We are. We, we had a. Yeah, I'm sorry. We actually do have some funding for that and are right. working through a short list, but not nearly as much as we need to. No, I, resilient, but I, so. remember, I remember that we talked about one or two community centers and the emergency operations center with some, but anyway, we, we don't need to get into that now, but we can do those things regardless of this action. So just want to be make sure that that's clear. Sure, the, the city can do that. That would be a public works project. And, and like, we'd have to like, have the funding for it, but that's, a, you have but to have that's the funding regardless for it. of that, we have to have the funding for it. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that that we understand the difference between, because a lot of the conversation at the beginning was about microgrid and then about utility, and we kind of conflated those two terms. The microgrid being at the scale across right-of-ways and across other things is where we need to go beyond a, a microgrid, but I just want to make sure that we all um, understand that. Now, as far as scaling it, and this, I was asking this question before, I mean, my interest, and I think the mayor's interest, is eventually potentially scaling this to a, other sites, and he talked about the airport. We heard we heard uh, Jennifer before she left mention the airport and the wastewater treatment plant and the ability to have it save money there by using our own utility. Uh, same thing with the, the mayor mentioned the arena. There's other potential options, but again, it strike. I believe Google would probably only fund a substation that would be the capacity they believe they need for their for site, and therefore, we would still need to figure out a way to spend what could be a hundred million dollars or more hundreds of millions of dollars on a new substation if we were thinking of expanding, and that would have to be funded somehow. Is that correct? That, that's correct, and how utilities typically do that is through revenue bonds. Right. Right. So, so, so anyway, we, we doing this, and I think it's a great opportunity to do it, see how we're at, or find out for sure there's no additional scale, um, and, and at least have an understanding that that's what we're going to be doing, is just testing this in one case, but need to start almost from scratch in another case if we did that. Yeah, just a comment on that. I mean, there will could be an opportunity. I mean, the, the transformers are kind of a key uh, piece of equipment, and they come in kind of standard sizes. And so the, the there likely would be installed transformers that will be bigger than the plan load for this project, which might present some opportunity. Um, but you'd also would then have to amend the interconnection agreement and you know, make sure that there's enough transmission capacity available to serve the project. But with these proposals that you've mentioned, the, the two uh, new DC uh, transmission lines, our expectation is there's going to be plenty of capacity to serve the load in this area in the future. Okay. And I don't, I don't have any doubt that Google's going to try to push the envelope on solar on their site. And those technologies are changing. I mean, you know, right now, we know, for example, Applied Materials had solar windows that allow light through but still collect energy and I hope that they would try everything they can to maximize the solar but you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll see how that plays out and my guess is one of the solar engine one of the Google engineers is going to perfect cold fusion at some point and then we'll be they'll just do that there too so we'll we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll get as much energy as we can um, one just one other question on the maintenance and operation we need staff for maintenance and operation and and you're saying that they would endow, in some sense, endow some of that staff, the startup costs, right? Um, do we think that the scale of what we're talking about at Downtown West is enough to sustain the staff needed to operate it, even if it doesn't get expanded to something larger? Yeah, we, we definitely do think that, um, and so that's what the model looked at, is the staffing levels to support that. You know, if we expanded bef beyond that, we may need incremental staff as well, um, but yes, that's that's what the study concluded. I don't know, Doug, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, and, and just to give you a flavor, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, several staff to start off, um, some outside consulting costs and, you know, legal costs are sort of the, the primary upfront costs. And, you know, that's on the order of a couple million dollars a year. Um, and, you know, as the load grows up, it, you know, that cost is, well, first off, some of those are just one-time costs, and they, they they're not ongoing. But 
once you've committed to higher staff, you know, you're making a longer term commitment. Um, and, and, you know, you would be adding staff at, as the, the footprint grows, but at the beginning, there, you know, there's a certain a small core mm -hmm. group that you have to have, okay. no matter what the load is. Right. Um, and, and then just about the reimbursement, Council Member Foley was kind of touching on this. The, the rates are being paid by mostly by Google, but also other, I guess, other tenants on, at their site. Um, and they're paying at a level that presumably is enough that we'd be building up a reserve that we could use to pay back. But the benefit to them is that the rates are as low as possible. So it's kind of just an interesting kind of weird circular thing in my mind. They could pay lower rates and we could never pay them back, or they could pay higher rates to give us enough money to pay them back. So I'm just trying to understand, I guess, <laughs> there's a, there's some sweet spot in there that will be figured out as we go along. Yeah, I think that's what we hope to define in the the business agreement and the reimbursement agreement that would be brought forward to council. I think primarily, you know, what we want to make sure is that we have built up that reserve before we start that repayment so that we do have a fund to take care of any operations and maintenance. But you're right, utilities could always raise the rates to be able to pay it back, but sort of one pocket into the other. Um, you know, and so, you know, I think what we've heard from them is the interest is to keep rates low, and, and you know, that would definitely would be our recommendation as well. Hopefully we could achieve that, at least that minimum of that 15%, and then, you know, start to repay, and then over time, lower the rates, um, you know, once once that repayment was finished, you know, it could, in the base case, it, it showed, you know, it could be 25%. But of course, there's more favorable scenarios where it could be better, and then, um, you know, more negative scenarios where we don't get to those savings, and in that case, our assumption is those costs don't get repaid. Okay, thank you. And, and my last question, I, I, I know there was, there's been some questions about when we have to make a decision and whether we're you know, whether Google is d depending on this, right, in some sense in their development. They're, 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 they like this idea because we're saying there's a cost savings in energy. Um, so if we go down this path and we're saying, well, we're, we're, we're pursuing this and we're hoping that there'll be a 15% savings in your energy, but then at some point the things don't pencil out for the council, the council says no, and all of a sudden now they have to go back to baking in that extra 15% back into their model. That's what concerns me is somehow going down a path that ends up not happening and changing the calculation for the downtown west development is that is that a risk you know i think that's something that could happen but that you know that is the risk they have today like if we decide we don't want to be in this then they're paying pg e rates and i think that's why they're interested in in looking at other options yeah. right but i think beyond that it's not just a rate thing it's that design flexibility to be able to build that really innovative grid of the future that they want to build Thank you. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I, I'm, I'll be happy to move the, the memo that the mayor put out. Um, I think you've also heard some input from members about things you'd like to make sure we continue to investigate. In Vice Mayor of Jones, yeah. Was that, was that the, was that the what you're referring to? He, Vice Mayor Jones made one, yeah. and I talked about expandability and other things, and just all those things as we move forward, continuing to keep in mind. I don't know if Vice Mayor Jones wants to spe specifically put something into the motion or not, but. Um, no, I'm, I'm happy with just providing that input. And, and I'll also second your motion, uh, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to clarify on one point, because I know David wasn't there in 2019 um, when we were discussing this, but my recollection is we were actually talking about neighborhood scale microgrids um, to try to get it scale to address the resilience challenge, because in a city of 280 square miles, deploying a few microgrids on a couple of city blocks was probably not gonna do much for our city. Um, so it was always our, our understanding that if we wanted to get across the street to be able to serve anybody beyond a single block, we needed a utility. Is that right, Lori? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I, I appreciate the distinction David's making, but practically speaking, if we really want microgrids to provide a solution for the city, we are talking about the same thing, microgrids and a public utility. It's gotta be together because otherwise we're gonna one off this thing and let's face it, we don't have a single microgrid yet that we've created in the city despite the fact that there was council direction to do so. Well, even we're gonna have, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom uh, on every block is not likely given the enormous cost. We need to do this at scale, which means we actually need to have 
probably one microgrid that grows that is a utility. Right. Just, just the expandability has to be part of the system. Then you do yeah. That. yeah. Exactly. And so we need the flexibility to do that, and that's that's the point of utility. And isn't it nice when we can do that on Google's dime, not on ours? Uh, Councilmember Jimenez. A lot to think about. My mind was spinning as we were talking. Um, so I, I appreciate that because one of the questions I had was, when does you know thirty microgrids uh, microgrids across the city in fact make us a, a real utility, if you will, right? And then who uh, how that works. And and so I appreciate the mayor's comments on that. Um, I guess for me, I, I am I am very supportive of doing everything we can to give Google as much flexibility as possible to build this build out this development. Uh, you, you know, in in how they want to build it out, make it as uh imaginative as, as technology advanced as possible um I, I guess for me that is one sort of slice of the discussion the other is do we want to go sort of full tilt at the city at some point right and i know it's been framed as and this is part of the challenge i have right is that moving forward it essentially leaves open the option to do that which which i appreciate and i can understand that but i what what gives me a little bit of heartburn is this the sense that sometimes we make decisions here on council, and this is a big decision, in which in which decisions like that essentially become the de facto path because we've already said let's bring forward these new codes, and that's sort of the track that we're on, and it's very difficult to get off the track. Um, and I just I, I just feel you know to the extent we've had some of this conversation in the past, but I just feel like I need a better, deeper understanding of of what you know the, the, some of the bonds that would be necessary to actually build stuff out and i know that's a long-term sort of discussion that would be had at a different time um but it, it's just i'm having trouble sort of disaggregating that and trying to make make a decision as it relates to uh providing google that space that they need and the larger discussion and more important discussion quite frankly but i know they're tied uh, is is going uh, you know doing this citywide and so what I'm curious about is is there a middle path here is there in your mind Laurie is there anything can we approach this in such a way in which we give Google that flexibility and we so sort of put the guardrails in where we say we're willing to go city utility here only until we have further, deeper discussions uh, about the, the exposure, about the financial liability, all that uh, at a later time. I'm trying to think through some of that. Yeah, council member, I actually think that's exactly the right way to do it. I think we have a, a case study here that is very clear um, that we think we've got a, a great opportunity to move forward with the speed that is needed by West Bank and the developer on which we will learn a great deal very rapidly about the efficacy of this and also can learn in parallel about the expandability and the scalability of this. Um, as somebody who, like you, uh, has had to learn into this, um, it is an extremely complicated subject of, um, of which we are graced to have some amazing experts on staff. But what I would commit to you very strongly is that we would absolutely come back to you and go into great depth before we were to expand this beyond Google. This would not be in any given Tuesday kind of, hey, here's the memo, by the way, we're doing an extra uh, half of the city. This would be something that we would need to take into a very careful consideration. Um, the the decision to create a new department is, or new division is a, is not a minor one for any city. And as you say, once it's there, it has a has a tendency to to sort of stick. Um, we believe that if this were to be a division that handled this development and only this development, that it's a decision that at this point looks like it makes sense for the city. But we would not move beyond that without a very considered and detailed conversation with the entire council as a whole and, and a, the assurance that you had the understanding that you needed to make that call. I think that's very reasonable. And I think that's actually the middle way that we're proposing. And, and, and Lori, and to you, Kip, anyone that can answer this. So if you go to, I was scrolling through the slide, I didn't realize there was like 38 slides. So in slide 37, <laughs> Uh, there's there's a timeline uh, of the next five years, right? Um, and, and so where do you all envision, assuming this all moves forward today, we say bring back the codes by the end of the year, we'll have that discussion. Um, I'm hoping other other colleagues chime in because I'd like to hear other perspectives. Uh, where where do you all see the off ramps, if you will, to saying, you know what, we, we, we're deciding we're gonna do it here, but we're actually not gonna go elsewhere or we're not gonna expand. Uh, 
I think the, the key off ramp, um, of course, are in December. If you don't want us to move forward with the formation of a, a municipal utility in the code, that, that we wouldn't have the power to do the work needed. The business agreement will, will, fight, will, will be the key one because that will spell out in, uh, in, in intricate detail the ins and the outs of the financing and the reimbursement and how the risks are shared and appropriated. And that really is the go, no go in many ways. The, the follow on of the design standards and such is, is all premised on the business agreement moving forward and would essentially have to come forward once you have the business agreement. So the key ones are the December decision and the, the 2023 decision around the business agreement. Beyond that, uh, moving forward on additional expansion would be a case by case. And we would come, I would think, with a study session or special meeting or series of them similar to this because it would be a similar order of magnitude decision. That would come as the opportunity arises and when we felt we had the confidence to move forward. I'd actually like it, 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 it to ask Nancy to come down and I just want to make sure that as someone who has a real understanding of West Bank and their perspective, we've been saying a lot of things about them, but you, you've been deeply in the conversations with them for uh, a couple of million years of your life. And if you could give us a sense of, of what your sense of the perspective is and, and their perspective on this. Kip, thank you very much, Mayor and Council, Nancy Klein, Economic Development and OCA. Um, there is a lot understandably to take here, but it's, it's incredibly important for uh, two major reasons. One is for Google in particular and other companies, it is their brand by 2030, I think is the year, to be at zero GHG company-wide. And the only way they're going to do that is in uh, developments like this, where they can come off the, the normal sets of power. And there are a lot of companies and other entities who are committed in that way. And, and honestly, and Lori is much more of an expert, that's the only way we're going to achieve our GHG goals. So we're not going to be able to afford to do this on our own. We're going to leverage, as Lori's leadership is um, taken us far, in this work. More broadly, on the dollar amounts, it, it's in no way that Google is saying, "City, you got to do this or I'm out of here. But we're, as a team, you guys included, really aware of costs. And right now is an incredibly precarious time. And for us to signal that we're not ready to explore and keep going and be open to, I mean, absolutely got to make sure this makes sense for the city. There's big issues here. But to make sure that we're moving forward with an opportunity and if there is the data that supports that we go forward. And it may be that it's this one, but I can tell you and have mentioned to Kip, and so that's why he's speaking about West Bank. Yeah, my apologies. I, I was confounding our, our, our different partners and it's downtown West was what I meant to say. But, but it's, it's, it's sort of prescient because West Bank is incredibly committed and they part of their decisions to keep m moving forward is if they can link their buildings with power grids. And just to spend a moment, because we brought West Bank up, um, already in Toronto as w and other parts of Canada and in Seattle, they, they are already implementing very significant grids and other uh, uh, heat gain, as the mayor mentioned, from sewer, et cetera. So they are here to demonstrate sustainability, all those trees on the buildings, et cetera. Um, and these generation of, of, of systems go absolutely hand in hand. If they think they can't do it, they won't be continuing to, to make the kind of investments we're seeing them make. And then the, the other thing, just to sort of counterbalance that, we have a we have a, a strong and sometimes overly aggressive risk oversight committee and group of folks that's working alongside Lori on this, and and we are very committed to taking a citywide perspective, um, and and making sure that the recommendations that we are bringing forward to you are based on looking at the complexity of managing the city as a whole, and not just the short-sighted question of does this work from a utility perspective. So I, I think I want to add that in as well because I, to your point, it's extremely complicated and this is a new business line that should be considered seriously. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Perales? Yes, thank you. Um, 
and appreciate the the dialogue and, and back and forth and, and the presentation from staff, the work that, that's gone into this. Um, I will echo some of the, the interest that the, the mayor was, was referring to, as I do have heard an interest from some of the development community, namely West Bank as well, uh, in addition to Google. Um, and um, I think that, you know, the, the, the opportunities that we have to be more resilient ourselves or um, or others, the development partners, um, are are really important for for being able to move forward with with the new development that we'd like to see here, especially in the downtown core with high rises. Um, I know San Jose State is proud to have uh, power generation and resiliency on on their site, and I, I hear that brought up um, from the the downtown development community. Um, so I, I would agree with with that, and and uh, an interest to want to try and, and continue to to drive down this path where I, I share some concern and I was able to, um, to get a, a peek at the, the mayor's memo, um, I, I, I believe it was yesterday. Um, and where I, I shared concern was just sort of taking this action that was in the, that's now the motion that we have, um, that is, is asking of staff on some muni code changes. Um, again, I, I don't think it's bad to be prepared, but I had a couple concerns with it. Number one, just myself, I, I didn't have too much time to kind of dive into the, to the understanding or, or significance of that. We've had some chance to talk about it today, but we really haven't heard back from staff. So I, I, I would be curious first on a response from staff on, on what that workload for that muni code change would be. Typically we would, uh, if this came through rules, uh, we would get a, a early consideration form on, on the workload there. And we, we didn't have a chance to, to see that here. Um, secondly, I also think it was, I, I was questioning, could we take that that action? Uh, I was confusing today with a, with a study session format um, because we had no agendized action for today besides accepting a report. And I think just out of good practice, it, it, it you know, would be wise not to uh, you know, submit an action at the last minute, one that I, even I was questioning, uh, and I, I likely believe there, there will be some in the community that aren't aware that we were taking an action today. And I'll bring one example up that um, is, is a muni code change as well. And um, I believe Matt Kano is, is in the audience. Um, and Matt, you may, you may know which one is coming here. But there's a very small uh, municipal code change that my office has been advocating for for over five years now. And, um, it, and it, I don't believe it should have taken that long. Um, and yet it has. And it's one that I'm hoping to see through to, to, to have a change before the end of the year. And, you know, I think had I have been aware that that municipal code change would have taken five years back when we first proposed it or had conversations about it, um, but I, I likely would have advocated differently and tried to get some support around it. Nonetheless, the, the example being shared there is that um, the, what we have is, is a request here for, in my mind, it could be a pretty significant municipal code change and being asked of staff to, to complete that in the next couple months. And so I first would like to hear from staff as a response on, on that, the direction that we have in the memo today on what is your capability of doing that and then while we're at it, if Matt, you want to be able to respond on, you know, if we can complete that within the next couple of months, why is there such a significant difference between that and, and a pretty small municipal code change on what I was referring to, um, if you don't recall, was, was on the mobile pet grooming um, that, that we, mobile pet groomers that we, um, that we permit in the city. Is it a mobile pet grooming ordinance? Is that is that what you wanted, Council Member? I'm just trying to clarify. We have one. It, it, it's a change to it. Oh, <laughs> so. I didn't even know we had one. So that's good to know. Uh, all right, Matt. Thank you, Matt Kano, Public Works Director. Um, Council Member Prowess, thanks for your question. On the animal care ordinance, the challenge I've had is weighing the costs and benefits. As as you're and many people are aware, we've been pretty overwhelmed at animal care and services this year and even spending four to six hours on something like this that it may take between 
the city attorney's time and my staff's time compared with um, everything else we've been balancing this year. Um, I haven't prioritized that muni code change because of the costs and benefits of, of taking the six or eight hours it would take to process it away from everything else we need to do. That is no excuse, Councilmember, for not having moved it forward in previous years. It has been there for a while. You're correct, and it should have been done by now, but that's why the past six to eight months we haven't focused on it. But I do need to follow up per my email to you last week. I do need to follow up with an answer to your question, and I will do so in the next week or two. And then, it, Roy, it, it meant, yeah, sorry, the, the intent wasn't <laughs> just to sort of publicly uh, shame you on that. The, the, I, I understand the, the, the challenge you're in, and, and I think you've done a, a tremendous job balancing the priorities. And I would agree, this isn't sort of up there as something, as you know, that I, my office has been saying, hey, let's get this done next week. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm turning out and, and looking back, and it's been five years, <laughs> right? It obviously is frustrating to, to, to know that it can't be, get done. and. What really what my point was, and so now I think maybe Kip is going to answer, but the, the point was, um, I, I want to hear from staff on, okay, we're getting asked on, on a, in my mind, a much more significant municipal code change. Is this, you know, can we get the workload assessment that we would tra traditionally get on a, on a early consideration form? And then after I hear that, if it is possible, then yes, I may be more frustrated that, you know, to hear that this could be done, but yet I'm still waiting, you know, Five years plus on on, on a pretty insignificant um, you know change. Yeah, council member is a really good question, Lori mm -hmm. Mitchell, director of community energy. You know, I think this really speaks to what can be done when you have a, a great development partner. So, uh, you know, as you know, that they are funding this work now. They fund um, Jim Caldwell here, who is a full time position working on energy resiliency, and so this is work that we've had underway, and so that's why we feel confident confident that we can bring it forward in, no, in December. Um, I will also say, um, you know, the other thing that uh, we've done a lot of preliminary work and, you know, this is a, a pretty common business throughout California and throughout uh, the United States that cities are involved in. And so there are a number of examples of municipal code from other cities. Um, that can make this work go, you know, faster in terms of, you know, we're, we're definitely not starting from scratch here. And in addition, I, I would add that uh, we did the equivalent of the early consideration form and uh, I feel that this is a green lit for the reasons that Lori put forward. We have that it's in the work plan it's, and it, the timing is actually um, beneficial to the developer partner and within our capacity to do with existing resources. So it meets our criteria for the green light. Also the additional motivation for uh, allowing it to proceed if you should direct us to do so is that this is on the city roadmap. Um, this is part of our, our energy resilience um, uh, uh, initiative, and there are four work streams in that initiative, and this is one of the four work streams within that roadmap from our perspective. And we'll be, we'll be bringing more detail to Transportation Environment Committee on that, and so we may get some conversations around those priorities, but from the administration perspective, we see this as a, a top priority consistent with direction we've had from you in the past, and we feel we have the sufficient capacity to do it. I, I asked those exact same questions of the staff when, when this was uh, vetted with me and uh, have confidence in, in their response because uh, of what they've told me. Okay, thank you, that, that is helpful. That was my main question, um, it sounds like, and I recognize obviously we're talking about different work groups, uh, but I think the, the, the significant difference here is we have uh, an independent and private funding source that's, that's funding you know, personnel in our, in, in our city to, to do the work. And so maybe Matt, I'm going to have to poke Google and, and see if they're willing to help uh, fund uh, some of your animal services, animal care and services, uh, and, and see if we can't finalize that other muni code change before the end of the year. But um, but thank you for for that, and, and uh, I, I can uh, support the, the motion. Thanks. Well, Google's doing everything else. Maybe they'll have a free app for mobile pet grooming as well. I, I was going to amend the motion to throw that in. <laughs> but. Okay, um, Councilman Jimenez, your hand is up. Is that from before? Okay, uh, let's just see, make sure everybody got their questions answered. We will have, I'm sure, more questions when this come back, comes back. I, I, there's no question this is complex and we expect lots more questions. So this is certainly not the end of this conversation. 
I just uh, re-raised my hand. Okay, Councilman Jimenez. <laughs> Changed my mind. <laughs> it's really not the end of the conversation now. No, I know, I know. It's the <laughs> start of the conversation, it seems. What I was just going to say to staff is just, obviously, you've heard a lot of comments here today, a lot of maybe gaps in knowledge, things of that nature. So I would say when we come back in December or so, uh, I think it would be good to maybe, if you can, supplement some of what you've provided to plug in some of the holes that you believe exist based on some of the questions. I think that would be helpful. Um, so just wanted to relay that. You did a great job, tons of tons of slides, tons of information, but if you can help fill some of the gaps in knowledge, that'd be helpful. That's, that's a great point. I, I think there are some really important questions that were raised today. So we've got a lot of work, good work's been done, but we've got a lot of questions to answer. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's then go to a vote. Jimenez? Oh. Oh. Yeah, we've had public comment already. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, now I'll ask Nora, do we have public comment if it's a study special, special session? Check to see if we notice it. This is Tony Tabor, City Clerk. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but it is no. We have an open forum on the agenda. We do. Yes, okay, we do. let's go to open forum then. Larry Beekman. Hi, Larry Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting. The mayor and civic innovation departments have made important new commitments to data collecting and racial equity this past June, and is shown by offering public meetings and city council agenda items on the current state of surveillance technology project projects within the city. It is from this, the city of San Jose simply needs to learn how to be more factual with the public about law enforcement and commercial surveillance technology and its data. The future of good technology practices relies on good public oversight and accountable open public policies. It needs honest facts from government to work towards this good future. With the recent uh, abortion issues and the concerns of all the data be, that can be collected from new streetlight te technology, along with the commercial data from electronic billboards, we are at a time in California to again address and work towards better, better civil protections with data collection for everyday community that can be easy to understand and to follow. Berkeley has recently taken some very interesting steps in this area and I invite you to look into. Uh, despite good sanctuary city laws we do have here in San Jose, we should be at the time the mayor and civic innovation department learn to make more honest, straightforward, and clear how this data is being bundled and then sold to different commercial and law enforcement entities. Uh, these entities may include ICE. Government should learn to trust what the everyday public can do with knowledge. It can help end cynicism, fear, apathy, and work towards a more sustainable future. Good public oversight and participatory democracy can be some of the best ways to observe 9-1101 and how to continue as a country of better ideals. And also uh, with that, please consider how current peace negotiations in the Ukraine may be much the same as the current use of continual war. Thank you. Back to the council. All right, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks everybody. Have a great weekend.